as well as all the colleagues joining us from the Department of Social Development. Uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on uh, Social Development. Namonde, um, can I just check, do we have a quorum? Yes, Chair, we do. Morning, thank you. Perfect, thank you so much and welcome back to you. And again, um, and as I said in your absence, the committee's thoughts and prayers are with you during this very difficult time. Um, my name is uh, Gillian Horsman and I'm the chairperson of the standing committee. Just a reminder to everybody, I'd like you to all uh, please mute yourself um, if you haven't done so. And just a brief introduction to those of you who don't know by now, the chat function is to be used for points of order. And if you'd like to um, engage and speak, please identify yourself um, by just letting me know. And please, when you do speak, um, please you feel free to use both your microphone and your video. Um, if you're not speaking, I'd advise you to please turn your video off. I'm going to ask the members of the committee present to introduce themselves. Good morning. Good morning, Chairperson and colleagues, Wendy Philander. Good morning, Philander. Good morning, Chairperson and colleagues, uh, Ricardo McKenzie. Good morning, Member McKenzie. Are there any other members? Okay, Nomonde, have we received any apologies? Uh, we received an apology from Member Makamba Poyache. Thank you very much. That apology is noted. I'm now going to um, ask uh, Minister Fernandez and the HOD Dr. Robert McDonald to introduce themselves. Uh, Minister, over to you. Good, good morning, Chairperson. I, I must apologize. It does seem as if I have a problem logging in with my laptop. I have used my phone temporarily, but I will try and get back in on my laptop, which makes it a lot easier. I'd like to say thank you to you, Honourable Chair, and the members on this platform participating in the committee, as well as those on the virtual platform for the opportunity to deliberate on our annual report for a vote seven. Thank you, Chairperson. I'll hand over to Dr. Robert McDonald. Thank you, Minister. Over to you, Doctor. Uh, good morning, uh, Honourable Chairperson and uh, Honourable Committee members, uh, and morning to the Minister and colleagues from DSD as well as the visitors. Uh, my name is Robert McDonald, uh, Head of Department. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to ask the other colleagues from the department to just briefly introduce themselves as well. Good morning, uh, Chairperson um, and members and colleagues. Um, I'm Juan Smith. I'm the CFO for the department. Good morning. Good morning, Chairperson and Honorable Members. I'm Zondileu, the Chief Director for Community and Partnership Development. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, uh, Chair, uh, members, the public. Um, I'm Marion Johnson, Chief Director for Business Planning and Strategy. Uh, good morning, Chairperson, members and colleagues. I'm Charles Jordan, and I'm the Chief Director for Children, Families and ECDs. Thank you. Good morning, members. Um, Leona Hwissen, Chief Director, Social Welfare and Restorative Services. Okay. Good morning, Chair. Um, 
Andrews and let me see, colleagues. No, so I'm James Holly, director for finance. Good morning. Good morning, Chairperson and Honourable Members and, and colleagues. I'm Clint Starling from the Department of Social Development, uh, Sup Supply Chain Management. Good morning, Honourable Members uh, and colleagues. Uh, Debbie Dreyer from Partnership Development. Good morning, Chair and Honourable Members. I'm Ananda Nau. I'm the Head of Ministry. Good morning, Chairs and Honourable Members, colleagues and members of the public. Um, I'm Tufa Hamtre, Director of Early Childhood Development and Partial Care. Good morning, Chair, Honourable Members, members of the public, and you see actually I'm Denzel Cowley, I'm the Director for Special Programs. Good morning, Chairperson and Members. I'm Mashinik Yonkerman, Acting Director for Facility Management. Morning, Chair, Members and Colleagues. I'm Anami van Renen, the Director of Operational Management Support in the Office of the HLD. Good morning, Good morning Honorable Members and Members of the Public. I'm Zuki Zikaba. Director of Retorative Services. Good morning, uh, honorable members and colleagues. My name is Leslie Corey. I'm the Director for Children and Families. Good morning, honorable members, members of the public and NEC, HOD. See, I'm Kathleen, Director of Business Planning and Monitoring. Thank you Good very morning. much. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, I'm Nosi Sitingani. I'm uh, the Deputy Director of Research, Population and Knowledge Management. I'm standing in for Gavin Miller. Thank you. Is there anybody else that? Sorry, Chairperson, if I may, we're fielding a pretty uh, solid team. I think it's representatives from every department. But I, uh, I think that was probably the last individual. But maybe to wait, make one more call in case we have missed anyone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Minister. We feel very honoured to have such a big DSD team um, with us today, and it's really nice to, to get to have everybody from across the board. Um, are there any members of the public joining us today? Um, as you know, this is a public um, engagement as well. don't see an indication that anyone from the public has joined in yet, so we shall move on. Um, colleagues, we are here today to deliberate on the annual report for the Department of Social Development for the year 2020. I'm going to dive straight into it and I'm going to hand over to the Minister for her overview remarks and I'm going to ask the Minister if she can keep it within five minutes. Um, and then we're also going to hand over to the HOD after that, if Dr. McDonald would like to um, add anything. Minister Fernandez, I'm handing it over to you. Good morning and thank you, Honourable Chairperson. As I greeted the members and all those present on the platform, uh, we are reflecting on an annual report that was done in what is considered to have been the normal world. And in the time that we were preparing for today, the world has changed significantly. Our world has literally been turned upside down. And in the last eight or nine months, as a department, we have had to reinvent the way we conduct our business. Because getting through or getting to the most vulnerable during the last period had proven difficult but it also had an impact in assisting us in getting everything together for this report. 
We have tabled a fairly comprehensive report. Um, I have picked up there might be one or two spelling errors, but they're not really considered to be um, significant uh, in that uh, the, a word might be spelled incorrectly. And for that, I apologize up front. Um, in terms of the commitments which I had made when I joined, and it's a pretty good 18, 19 months ago now, our focus was on a safer and cohesive uh, communities, and we also talked about empowering people. So strengthening families was a key area, and that came through strengthening youth the strengthening the resilience and uh, youth interest came through and then of course a very strong focus on gender-based violence and substance use disorder we have um, seen gender-based violence numbers spiraling in the last few days and weeks as compared to when this report period took place so we are seized with the most important challenge of our life. And I think that is the shadow pandemic, which is gender-based violence. Um, in terms of empowering people, we, there was quite a bit done. The department had to step in, as many of the members will know. Um, at, the, at the end of this reporting period, it had started already in March. And we had to take on a humanitarian role, which typically is vested in Chapter 2 of the Social Services Act, which is a function normally performed by SASA. However, in a crisis, we all have to pull together and to make things happen. We have had quite a few challenges, uh, but not without opportunity and we have worked, I think, in my opinion, well as a team to ensure that we have tried to cover all our bases. There are areas, it would be remiss of me not to mention, that there are certain areas that we have not achieved the desired objective or outcome. But as with any, uh, any situation, there are mitigating factors. There, are, there is the human element among and uh, I just wish to thank the opportunity, I think thank the committee for the opportunity to present our, our report and for it to be deliberated on. I've always appreciated the absolute transparency, the robust yet courteous and dignified manner in which the process has been managed. And I trust that today would be um, no different. And then finally, Chairperson, I do want to express my thanks up front to our HOD, Dr. Robert McDonald, um, under his capable leadership and that of a very capable management team who are all in the room this morning. But most important, our foot soldiers, the social workers, the social auxiliary workers, Every single staff member who belongs to the family of Team BSD, they deserve the gratitude and the thanks because their contributions have rolled up into this annual report. And I trust that they will see their contribution as we work through the report. On that note, Chairperson, with your permission, I shall hand back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, I just want to also welcome Member Baku Baku Force and Member Windwokel. Um, they had technical difficulties joining. Member Baku Baku Force and Windwokel, please will you introduce yourselves? Good morning, Chairperson, everyone. My name is Rachel Windwokel. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Member Baku Baku Force, are you there? Yes, leadership. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, welcome, ma'am. Um, I'm now going to hand I'm over. I'm Honorable Baku Baku. 
Thank you. Welcome, um, Member Bakubaku Force. Thank you very much, my lead. I'm now going to hand over to the HOD. Um, if there's anything Dr. McDonald would like to add to the minister's opening remarks or anything that Dr. McDonald would like to say. Thank you very much, Honourable Chair. Um, I think uh, in the interest of time, I would uh, uh, not add anything. Uh, I think most of the uh, issues are covered in depth in the annual report, so uh, I, I won't take up any more time uh, adding to that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McDonald. Um, members, I'm now going to allow for first round of uh, questions based on the opening remarks the Minister has made. Um, as you know, we're going to approach this report um, in sections, and we're also going to allow for members of the public, um, if they have any questions, to ask their questions. So we just have to structure our time very carefully. Um, I see one hand thus far, um, Honorable McKenzie. Is there anybody who'd like an opportunity to ask questions based on um, what the minister um, has just said? If you could just raise your hand as well. Uh, Member McKenzie, while I wait, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. Can I ask the question also link with the minister's forward and the director general's forward? Is that fine? Sorry, I was muted there. Um, that's fine, um, uh, Mr. McKenzie. What we can do, I think, is we'll start with this round of questions. We'll ask um, around what the minister's just said as well as the, the foreword uh, that's given by the minister and the uh, DG. So that will be part A. So we'll cover all the questions for part A in this round. I'll hand over to you, Mr. McKenzie, and then I'll wait the other members to see your hands. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, Minister and the uh, Department. Can I just get a say that, uh, oh, I just see, I thought Mr. Jordan was not here, but I just see he's in the meeting now. <laughs> Chairperson, on terms of the Minister's forward and what we're reading here, uh, um, in terms of what the Minister said, also want to echo and just thank the Minister and the Department for the crucial role that they played, uh, not only for the last year under review, but also the last nine months of this pandemic. So uh, thank you very much from my side. Chairperson, on the strengthening families and uh, uh, and under the preserving family units, I just want to get an understanding from the minister. Uh, uh, how do they measure that, and and how would they reckon the success has been for the year under review? Because that will also link to our youth at risk, which is also on page eight of a forward in terms of decreasing violence in our communities. Uh, uh, how would they measure that? And with the launch of the 16 days of active uh, um, of no violence uh, campaign on the 11th of December last year for the 365 campaigns, uh, from there until the end of March, uh, what sort of activities did they do? Because understand it's a 365 days campaign, so what sort of activities do they do on a daily basis to strengthen this campaign? Because we know it's a terrible uh, 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 issue in our communities. If they can just share with the, um, with the committee what sort of activity they do on a daily basis, because it is a 365 days campaign, and how do they measure that impact? Then the question to the Director General uh, on page 11 of his forward, uh, something that's particularly prevalent in our communities uh, is the transport of disabled uh, individuals. And with the purchase of the four 16-seater uh, vehicles during the year under review, how do people access it? And where do people go to access it? Because one of the concerns they were raised by, by a gentleman by, by the name of Ellen, and I saw he's been tagging the minister on social media as well, is that it's quite a, I think he said something to the tune of 750 rand a round trip to Cape Town for him as a disabled individual. Where does that service sit? And what, how are they going to expand that service for the upcoming year, given the challenges we're facing? For the year under review, and we see the numbers here, and I saw it also somewhere else, 22,000 people took advantage of the youth development process uh, funded by the department. The youth cafe specifically, and I'm going to talk to the one in my constituency uh, uh, in Mitchell's Plain in town center. How are the 
because two or three years ago it was quite active and very active, but I get a sense that it has not been active uh, for the year under review. Uh, and what has happened and how are they going to expand that services to give more people access to the youth cafes? And going forward, how are they going to start structuring that service to the youth, particularly youth, given the high unemployment rate, given the high social uh, issues prevalent in our community going forward? What is their vision for this youth cafe? And the uh, victim offender uh, mediation program, where is that? We, we, I hear what you say here in the program on page 11. But going forward, what is the strategy? Where is that sitting and who's monitoring that program in the department? I couldn't see exactly who and who's been held accountable for monitoring this program in the department. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Member McKenzie. Um, I don't see any other hands from any of the members yet. I'm just going to ask members if they could verbally indicate if they have any questions on part A, inclusive of the minister's introductory remarks. Chairperson? Yes, Member Van Poffel? Member Van Poffel, you may continue. Yes, Member Van Poffel, you may continue. Chairperson, mine, sorry, Chair, I, I realized that I was on mute. Um, Chair, mine is on page eight also, the forward by the MBC. Um, I just need to, on, on bullet point one, social work services are read, readily available to assistance, assist where children are exhibiting risky behavior or are affected by trauma. What I want to know there is whether the department believes 64 social workers uh, deployed to the Western Cape Education Department is enough um, to assist over a million, million learners in, and thousands of teachers. So if not, um, perhaps what are the plans to increase the number of social workers in school? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Member Van Vohel. Member Baku Baku Force. Thank you, Chairperson. My question is on page nine, bullet point two. What the department uh, is saying, they are ensure that early childhood development programs were was uh, implemented, especially in our poorest and most vulnerable communities. I would like to ask whether the MEC and the department have had engagements with the WCED and other stakeholders regarding the transfer of ECD competence to the WCED, and what is the province readiness for this? Can I ask the second question, Chair? Yes, you may, ma'am. The may second ma question is also in uh, page nine, where uh, in paragraph, paragraph four, uh, I want to ask uh, that what was the impact of COVID-19 on the functioning of the department whether there were any reported case and death in residential facilities for elderly people, and what measures are put in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in these facilities. Thank you. Regarding Member. this, uh, the second wave, I would like to know that can I move for the uh, paragraph 10? That yes, will be the last question from my side. Yes, you may. 
thank you, Chair. In paragraph one, the la in the last sentence, in page 10, the department are saying at the same time, the economic context together with a rapidly growing provincial population and an increase in social ills has resulted in a increased demand for department services. My question there is as follows, within this increasing demand for the department services, what creative measures have been put in place to meet the demand? How was um, COVID-19 pandemic contributed to this increasing demands for service and how is it addressed? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. In the last um, round, person in this round is Member Philander. Chairperson, um, thank you very much. Chair, the Minister has um, elaborated on the 365 days of activism for no violence against um, women and children. Chairperson, I just want to know um, how does the department encourage a multi-sectoral approach, Chairperson? And uh, the reason for my question is, um, especially, Chair, on, on at these um, more remote and rural um, areas, I think we all can agree um, chairperson, that we are at a point of no return when it comes to gender-based violence. And also, um, Chairperson, in terms of legislation, what is the department's drive um, on, on amending legislation provincially and encouraging that nationally as well um, in order for us to, to, to stop the scourge of gender-based violence? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Member Philander. I'm now going to hand over to the Minister and the HRD uh, to respond to those questions, please. Uh, Chairperson, thank you to the honorable members. I think what the way we're going to deal with this is I would like to provide just a brief overview because four honorable members have asked uh, questions that um, I could respond to, but the detail is actually vested in programs and the directors and program managers are on this platform. But I think what is important firstly for the members to understand is the, the context of the blue book and the period under review. We are looking at the 1st of April, 2019 to the 31st of March, 2020. Um, I joined the department in May, and I then got to know a team of people that is spread across, uh, not just in head office, but across 41 offices virtually across the province. We also have facilities that are, um, are located across the province. And most importantly, our staff complement borders something on 2,500. So we do rely heavily on our NPO funded partners who are basically the foot soldiers for the department. So in areas where we cannot reach, where we do not have an office, we might have an NPO that we fund in that area that provides the service. So I think that has to be considered that it is unlike in health and education where you can measure the number of teachers and nurses, a DSD has an extended uh, footprint. I also want to clarify and thank you, Honorable Baku Baku Foss and uh, Member Windvogel. We have social workers within DSD. The Department of Education also has social workers and often there's confusion regarding uh, are they DSD social workers or education social workers? And then similarly, our stakeholder partners, the ICFPFs, the BDSs, they too have social workers who engage on our behalf in certain matters. So it, it is not a very simple 
arrangement in that there are many role players who we need um, we need to be mindful of and do we need to engage. So uh, the question by the Honorable McKenzie in terms of strengthening families, youth at risk and especially the youth cafe, um, I'm going to ask uh, that that go to um, Dr. McDonald, but I do to, to hand to an official, but what I do want to say that at all our offices, whether we have the Mitchell's Plain office, the Kai Leacher office, the uh, Athlone office, in that community again, there are NPO partners who work with us to assist in, in terms of strengthening families, all of the other men stuff mentioned. The Youth Cafe is Honorable McKenzie. Yes, it is being revisited. And then I'm just going to at a very high level talk to the fact that we have a disability desk in our department and that disability desk focuses on um, universal accessibility within government as well as some of our outside facilities. And I do know we were scheduled to hand over two vehicles because we had made a commitment that we would be providing four vehicles. On the question, um, HOD, I hope that um, I'm just providing the overview that um, the directors and CVs will pick up. The issue of social workers, Honorable Van Poorkel, I don't quite understand. Uh, I, the last part I heard where you said, how can 64 social workers service a million people? Uh, I just need clarity is that if that is the reference to the education social workers, because often we also go into schools and assist and work in conjunction with WCED when the need arises. In fact, in most of our areas, we have a very strong working relationship between health, education, sports, arts and culture and DSD, of course, with safety underpinning it. The um, Honorable Baku Baku Foss, the ECD migration is something that is scheduled to take place in this reporting period and not the one under discussion. However, there is a plan afoot um, and the we do have Ms. Tukfa Hamdule on the platform who can talk to that. The impact of COVID-19 on our old age homes was an area where we really had to rally very quickly because many of the homes were not uh, linked directly to um, DSD in the sense that it could have been privately funded facilities. But we, the team under the capable leadership of Chief Director Charles Jordan, ran around, got the PPEs, and we can talk to the numbers. I can assure you that every Friday I get an update on the, at this point in time still, on the number of positive cases in our old age homes, the number of recoveries, and sadly the number of persons who might have been deceased in a specific period of time, the reporting, is normally week on week. And then to the Honorable Philander, we do have a multi-sectoral approach. Uh, our Chief Director, Liana Khwesen, the VEP, the Victim Empowerment Program, uh, sits in her directorate. But um, what we have done, and I think this is something I just want to talk to for a minute, because the Honorable McKenzie, I think, raised the fact that we launched 16 days, 365 days of no violence on the 11th of December 2019 at the city of Cape Town. And at that event, all stakeholders were present. We then followed it up with an event on the 31st of January at Lentegeer Saps, where we dropped the reporting level down to that of regional 
so we could engage. Um, I remember, was it Brigadier or Colonel Gulam and Colonel Cleo Arnaldus? We had the NPA, we had everyone in the room. That was January. February, our event was supposed to take off, and then, of course, COVID crept along. But what we have done, um, and it might be out of the reporting period, but we have set up a transversal government gender-based violence forum. We have established a gender desk in the ministry. Um, I have been mandated by cabinet to lead gender-based violence in the province. And we have Dr. Heidi Souls who heads the gender desk. And what happens is that once a month, we meet with every single gender desk official from each and every government department. And we um, are hosting presentations to familiarize uh, our, our colleagues and counterparts as to the work that we are doing. Many of you might know about the National Strategic Plan. We were very thrilled when the Premier provided an opportunity for an entire cabinet session to be dedicated to gender-based violence. And that event took place on the 25th of August this year. And so we could actually, for the first time in the history of this government, we, at the start of 16 days, had a template with every single department reporting all the activities that they would do, as well as all our DSD activities across the province. So we work very closely with the National Women Shelter Movement, Many of you might know um, Advocate Bernadine Bacher is the chairperson for the Western Cape Shelter Movement. And we have maintained close ties, not only with the shelter women movement, but activists and active citizens in this province. And there I must thank our public reps from all political parties who have used the opportunity to alert, to alert my office to any issues that might have existed or the, if there was any need where a life was threatened and we tried to be as responsive as possible. So to get down to the detail of um, the numbers and how we go about the measurements, with your permission, honorable members and chairperson, I um, would like to uh, ask that Dr. McDonald uh, palm out, fan out the questions, but I must comment uh, on our current situation. Our current situation has seen high levels of unemployment. We have seen an increase in substance use disorder. We have also, it's not a pretty picture, but we also see many children who have not returned to school. However, this is difficult to manage because remember schools had alternating days. You either went to school on a Monday, Wednesday or Friday or on a Tuesday and Thursday. And then sadly with the resurgence of uh, the virus in this province, we are now looking at um, our protocols again, because during COVID, which is not part of this reporting period, we had five uh, shelters that were what we call COVID-1 shelters where women could go and children and men if needed in, in specific cases for the first 14 days where they could be um, treated and attended to in terms of the COVID protocols and then they would be transferred to a secondary facility. So um, as many of you know, substance abuse feeds into gender-based violence. It is something I am passionate about uh, being a survivor and I remain committed with my team to ensuring that uh, we look at the legislation and Honourable Member Philander, the um, officials will talk you through 
the three pieces of legislation that we've had to deal with and provided inputs on. And then, Ms. Bakabar, Honorable Bakabaku Frost, there was one last thing, the ECDs. I can assure you that we, I was actually out in Wellington uh, three weeks ago with the um, with key stakeholders. We are looking at, we are working actively on a pilot out in uh, Drakenstein, Drakenstein and the Cape Winelands, and we actually have corporates on board as well as the Department of Health, and they are already doing assessments in terms of baseline stunting, curricula, and everything else. That, however, will form part of our next annual report uh, because it is outside of the space of this annual report. However, I thought to include it so that it can provide context to the honorable members in terms of understanding the very fluid situation we face. And it is an extremely dynamic and volatile environment. And through all of this, our staff too have been affected by COVID-19. So we had experienced days where we could not deliver services due to offices being closed. And just as recently as 10 days ago, we had eight of our offices closed. So I share that with you to give you an insight to the reality that our frontline first responders staff are not immune. And we have made every effort to provide them with the necessary PPE. However, we see the spread of this virus at a rate uh, greater than we saw during the first round. So we also have to act responsibly and to take care of our staff. However, we do try and communicate timelessly with, um, with stakeholders if an office is closed and we try and make the necessary alternative arrangements. And then just, I think the question might probably arise SASA is a national entity. SASA reports directly to the National Minister of Social Development. During the period under review, Mr. De Graaf, who was the provincial manager, uh, was relegated back to his normal position. SASA undertook a centralization exercise where the authority was uh, vested in the Eastern Cape. Uh, the management of the Eastern and Western Cape was done in the Eastern Cape. And that too has proved very challenging for us to maintain open lines, especially when it came to the 350 SRD. But I think I've provided a pretty holistic overview of the, the actual reporting period where we are currently, the situation we find ourselves in. And I will now ask a uh, chairperson with your permission, ask Dr. McDonald to respond and then also to direct questions to the uh, relevant um, officials in terms of more specific drill downs. Thank you, honorable chairperson. Thank you, Minister, for that very comprehensive um, response as well. Uh, Dr. McDonald, I'll hand over to you and your team. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Chair. Um, so uh, just to work through the questions uh, in the order in which they were put um, to the department, in terms of the, the services for preserving families and uh, how do we measure that, um, there are of various mechanisms. So the first is is that we we actually have the performance information on the number of families that are reached, and the performance indicator and its description speak to um, the specific requirements for us to count those uh, families. Um, there are various levels of family intervention. So if there is, for example, um, a marriage counselling provided, then there are uh, specific things that need to be done in that space. If it is to do with um, uh, the uh, family intervention that's been ordered by the, um, the children's court because of um, uh, problems in the family, 
then the social workers um, will then intervene uh, using the, whatever methodology is appropriate considering the challenges facing the family, whether it's substance abuse treatment programs uh, or whether it's anger management or um, coping mechanisms and communication skills and so forth. So there's there's a range of different uh, things that are done in, in terms of support to families. And it ranges from a, pr a preventative type of work where um, families are strengthened that are deemed to be potentially at risk. Uh, so particularly we'd be looking there at teenage uh, parents or very young parents uh, and um, uh, uh, children uh, where, where there's um, uh, children being picked up with behavioral challenges at schools and being referred to DSD. Uh, then there is families that are more seriously at risk uh, where there's been incidents of um, domestic violence or of um, uh, child neglect or other issues where then the, there's a much more in-depth investigation conducted by the social workers uh, and uh, uh, various initiatives undertaken at the most extreme uh, cases the child may be taken away uh, and then a reunification plan be drawn up uh, that would involve a requirement that the family undergo certain uh, family strengthening processes um, before reunification with their child can be allowed by the courts. So uh, it, it's uh, quite a broad range of initiatives. Um, in terms of the, the measuring, the, we, we keep track of the number of families that have been assisted. The uh, details of what has been done for each family is, is captured in the social work the social workers uh, process notes and case files for the, the families. And um, there is also um, the uh, funded NGOs that assist uh, with um, family strengthening work. Uh, the evaluation of that is not something you can just do uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. It does require um, a in-depth uh, evaluation. Uh, and to that end, the department has uh, previously done a uh, in-depth evaluation of the um, family strengthening and uh, what is working, what is not working, and what needs to be improved. Uh, so uh, that can be made available uh, to Member McKenzie if you would like to have a look at that. Um, essentially, it's uh, it, it requires every few years that we do an evaluation that usually will take a year or more um, to carry out. Um, because it requires looking at um, uh, 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 doing in-depth qualitative work with the families. Um, so unfortunately, it's not something that one can uh, measure success as such um, year on year. There are certain proxy indicators that also uh, that we also look at. We look at the um, issue of um, all the rates of child abuse and neglect, uh, and we look at the rates of um, particularly um, divorce and those those uh, other proxy indicators, but they're quite a rough indicator. So uh, it put, it's it's uh, uh, there's not a immediate correlation between the department's work and those figures, um, but there is there is there is something you can track statistically to look at the overall state of the, the um, of well-being of families. Um, the programs that are implemented for families are um, by and large evidence-based programs, so they've been tried and tested in controlled environments. So um, that also provides us with an additional um, area where we can look at fidelity to the um, model that's applied to ensure that, that it is also um, being correctly um, uh, implemented uh, along the lines of what has been shown to, to provide results. Uh, in terms of the activities um, for the 365 days uh, of no violence against uh, women and children, um, the, uh, the, the um, minister has spoken in depth to that, um, so I won't go back into that again, uh, save to say that uh, the, uh, in the middle of this year, um, there was the approval of the National Strategic Plan for Gender-Based Violence uh, by the National Cabinet. And um, the uh, Department of Social Development in the Western Cape has been mandated by the provincial cabinet to take the lead uh, in developing an implementation plan uh, that will be carried out within the framework, the strategic framework set out by the National Strategic Plan, um, so that we can build that into uh, into the way that we work, uh, not only in the Department of Social Development but intersectorally. Uh, and particularly with um, uh, not only provincial departments, but also the SAPS, criminal justice system, municipalities, civil society, uh, and um, other stakeholders. So 
I think um, the, the that that uh, implementation plan is due uh, early in the new year um, and will be uh, consulted broadly once the first draft has been produced uh, so that we can get the buy-in of all of the stakeholders. Um, the In terms of the question from Honourable Member McKenzie about the transport of disabled individuals uh, and the question about how people access it, um, the, the the transport for disabled children that the Department of Social Development is providing is, is something that was, uh, is a beginning of a process that is being executed um, pursuant to a court ruling um, after an application was made to the High Court by um, the certain civil society organizations spearheaded by um, the right to education. Um, and the, the, the ruling basically requires the government across the board, uh, both nationally and provincially, um, step up efforts to provide uh, reasonable education and development opportunities to children with severe to profound intellectual disabilities. So the, uh, as part of the uh, requirements of, um, of meeting that court order, uh, a big gap was identified in terms of transport for, for severe to profound disabled children uh, who need to access um, daycare and um, educational opportunities at daycares. And therefore, um, the, the provincial treasury provided some funding for uh, uh, Department of Transport and Public Works and DST to work together on procuring uh, the first of a set of specially adapted vehicles for the purpose of transporting uh, children with severe to profound intellectual disability in line with the court ruling. Um, the first, first of those vehicles have been procured um, and uh, we are preparing now to, to donate them to um, the, the certain organizations that will be using them uh, to transport the children to, um, to the daycares. So they're not a um, open access uh, opportunity for transportation for the disability sector. They're very specifically for children in um, daycare centers with, and children with severe to, severe to profound intellectual disabilities. Um, the broader uh, access to uh, transport for persons with disabilities uh, is currently with uh, the municipality and uh, the, well, the city of Cape Town has, has uh, initiated the Dial-A-Ride program. And uh, that, uh, that program is, is accessible for the public. Um, I think that, that, that it is currently uh, very much oversubscribed and there's, there's clearly a need, I think, for uh, additional uh, capacity in that program, uh, but um, it's, it, it doesn't fall within the Department of Social Development's vote. Um, the, the, the next question from Honourable Member McKenzie related to the question of youth cafes. Um, and the question about the, the, whether they've been active in the year under review and whether there's plans to expand. Um, I can say at the moment that there is no plans to expand uh, for the coming financial year or the year after that because we are facing enormous cuts, which will pretty much prevent us from expanding anything, um, including youth cafes. Uh, so that certainly will not be possible um, for the, at least for the two years until the massive uh, budget deficits and a uh, shortfall in revenue collection um, have been overcome uh, nationally um, because all provinces and national departments are going to take a cut for at least two years as a result of the um, uh, recession and uh, which was greatly aggravated by the COVID situation. Um, but I will ask um, Mr. Hewu, um to speak briefly to the, the level of involvement in the youth cafes during the year under review. Um, and whether they are being utilized um, uh, uh, properly and um, adequately by the youth uh, in the areas where they are situated. Um, uh, Mr. Hewell, could you perhaps assist uh, the Honorable Member? Thank you, thank you, HOD. Uh, Honorable Member, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Chairperson, I can confirm that the number of attendance of young people to the youth cafe has uh, uh, decreased. It has been first primarily because of the prevalence of gangs uh, in the area. Uh, most of our young people walk to these youth cafes 
and now their safety is at risk when there are gangs in the area. What the youth cafe has done, it has actually used creative methods of reaching young people. Uh, they went to, to, to schools to participate and reach young people during the after school program. And also they went to selected uh, communities where there's been less uh, security risk in terms of the gangs to speak to and, 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 and address the needs uh, the young people. And that has actually made the, 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 the young people in the area to at least access the services uh, that they will have received that they attended to the youth cafe. Uh, the numbers uh, of the young people that have actually been reached by the youth cafe is actually more than 1,500, which was the second best performance to, to judge. So we're comfortable that although young people are unable to go to the cafe, they have received the services that are offered. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ewell. Um, and then returning to the question, uh, the last question from Honorable Member McKenzie was uh, around who monitors the offenders programs in the Department of Social Development. Um, that would be um, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Garber and uh, um, the Chief Director, Ms. Leona Khoisin, um, and uh, his program office uh, for um, the, uh, the uh, probation and diversion services, which is known as the Social Crime Prevention Program. Also, uh, the Ms. Khoisin uh, and her facilities team uh, deal with um, uh, under 18s in conflict with the law um, who are brought into the facilities and of course some of those uh, uh, youth also uh, up until the age of 21. Uh, so it's uh, but the, the the program for diversions and probation services uh, is essentially coordinated under Mr. Garber's social crime prevention team but all of the Department of Social Development's regional offices um, and their local offices have uh, social workers who are serving as probation officers who work with the courts to um, assist with the um, uh, offenders who need to go into diversion programs. And um, we do have the statistics in the annual report on the number of both adults and uh, children who were assessed um, uh, as a result of having been arrested and charged criminally. Um, and also uh, the young uh, children and adults who've been through diversion programs, um, either programs that have uh, some of our local offices run themselves and also NGO funded, uh, funded NGO diversion programs. In terms of uh, Honorable Member Van uh, question regarding um, the, uh, the social workers assisting um, children with risky behavior in schools, um, the Department of Education hires um, those social workers and um, I think the, the question of whether or not they're sufficient to uh, assist the schools uh, would need to be posed to the Education Department, but from a Social Development Department perspective, um, we certainly see the need to, to provide a supplementary role, as the Minister has mentioned. And uh, many times the social workers at the Department of Education um, will be the first port of call, but will refer cases to social development as well. Um, the Department of Education also has um, approximately 100 uh, psychologists as well as part of that same team that deals with the, social, uh, the same social work team. So it's a com combined team of um, psychologists and social workers um, that serve as the schools. But we are looking to strengthen the linkages between the um, individual schools, particularly in areas where there is um, high levels of um, school dropouts and um, crime and violence among um, the youth in those areas, uh, so that we have a more direct relationship with the education department's um, principals and social workers, uh, so that we can have a more streamlined referral process because we are picking up that um, referrals aren't always effective between the education department and social development. Um, and it's not necessarily down to either one department um, uh, uh, being at fault. Sometimes uh, it is social development, social workers um, who um, feel that the, the matter belongs with the education department, social workers, and sometimes uh, it's the education department, social workers, um, feel that it should go to um, social development and, this, and uh, the social development social workers are not taking the cases and then sometimes it's the other way around. 
where um, the Department of Social Development uh, social workers um, are not alerted to a matter. So there, there are problems with the referrals between um, schools and um, social development services at times. Um, in many areas it is working well, but in, in some areas it doesn't work as well. And uh, we are embarking on a process in partnership with education to strengthen those linkages so that we can as early as possible pick up children at risk in schools uh, and intervene uh, uh, preferably at primary school level already um, where there's behavioral challenges or where children are exhibiting signs that um, there, is pro there are problems at home uh, that are putting them at risk. Um, in terms of the questions from uh, member Baku Baku Foss, uh, the, the issue of the um, transfer of function, <clears throat> um, uh, the minister is correct, it is a, uh, outside of this reporting period, but uh, it, 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 and in fact, it's also unclear at this stage when in fact the, the transfer will proceed. Um, the department, uh, the MEC and social development have had numerous engagements with the Western Cape Education Department on this issue of the transfer function. Um, uh, I've personally engaged with the Education Department's Management Committee um, to, to, to brief them on what has been proposed. And the National Departments of Education and, uh, and Social Development have also been convening um, engagements with the provincial education and DSD departments uh, on, uh, across the country on this. The National Department of Social Development has also had a consultation session with the NGO sector, the ECDs in particular, um, uh, last year. Uh, however, um, we expect that there will be need for further consultation given that um, uh, that was uh, only really an initial um, engagement. Uh, I think also the, the important point uh, to emphasize is that um, the transfer function is a process and um, there are a number of uh, uh, statutory requirements that need to be fulfilled. Uh, in order for the transfer function to happen. So in the Western Cape, the uh, Department of Social Development is um, one of the more fortunate uh, departments in the country because uh, we have a centralized um, ECD unit uh, in which, which is situated in the head office that uh, deals with ECDs in the province. Um, so if there, if there is a move um, from the educa uh, DSD to education, the unit is able to be moved as a, a single entity. Um, and uh, this makes it uh, relatively straightforward uh, by comparison with some of the other provinces where uh, early childhood development is part of their um, regional and local office functions and they're having great difficulty in determining how to uh, uh, separate that out uh, uh, from the department's uh, uh, line uh, units and move it across to education uh, because some staff members involved uh, in ECD support work are also involved in other areas of social development work uh, and it's difficult to determine who should move and who should stay. Um, the transfer function is also going to require a uh, organizational design process which would be the formal public service act um, prescribed process for uh, the movement of function. Uh, between departments and it would also require by law a consultation process with the unions um, which would also be required to fulfill the, uh, the um, uh, basic conditions of employment and labor relations acts. Um, so it is a process that needs to go through the bargaining chambers uh, and then there's also financial processes involved which need, which need treasuries um, work. So. The Western Cape uh, is, is at an advanced level of readiness in terms of having um, set out all the, the things that need to be done. And uh, we have initiated the organizational design process, um, which will involve the consultation with unions. Um, but the move will only be able to actually happen uh, once, uh, first of all, that process is finished. Secondly, after the National Treasury has done the necessary shifting of the uh, budget structures uh, for ECD from the DSD vote seven to the education vote. And also only after the uh, Premier issues a proclamation uh, that would uh, effectively shift the um, powers and functions of the MEC 
as well as the powers and functions of the head of department uh, to uh, from DSD to the education MEC and education head of department. Um, so uh, we, we are relatively uh, ready uh, and we do believe that we would have a smoother process than uh, some of the other provinces where they're still going to have to actually uh, create the structure that moves over and, and disaggregate that from the other functions that staff are performing. Uh, in terms of the uh, question, uh, the second question from member Baku Baku Foss, um, we have, uh, what was the impact of COVID-19 on the functioning of the department? Uh, the, uh, it, was a, it was a very significant impact. I think we um, had to deal with uh, a, a new way of working uh, remotely. We had to reduce our offices down to skeleton staff, but at the same time, social development, uh, social work services are um, critically required um, and legislated services, so we, we needed to maintain those services. Uh, the department's the department run um, residential facilities um, was uh, also needed to fully cont continue to fully function although the facilities were put under lockdown so there were no visitors allowed um, and uh, but all staff still needed to attend and work um, and um, the department's local offices were reduced to skeleton staff uh, with social workers working remotely and conducting uh, engagements with clients via um, electronic uh, connection where possible uh, and only se severe emergency cases uh, were brought before the courts because the, the um, children's courts were also um, put under lockdown and reduced to only essential cases being heard. Uh, what this did do was it pushed back um, and delayed uh, some cases which has resulted in a slight um, bottleneck uh, later in the year. Um, it also created um, or slowed down the extension of foster care orders, um, which uh, which was unfortunate because we were trying to clear the backlogs of foster care cases. Um, so that did that did slow down the, the clearance of extensions because courts were not hearing extensions. Um, and uh, the department's head office also uh, was working remotely, and um, was able to still continue funding all NGOs. Fortunately and also uh, was able to put in place uh, a number of emergency measures, um, including um, the shifting of funds in our in the last part of the, bu the budget year um, so that we could have a special rollover, which you'll, will, the, the committee will be seeing later on, um, which was used for um, food parcels uh, to assist people during the lockdown who were either in quarantine or isolation or otherwise unable to um, support themselves uh, during that period before the COVID-19 grants were introduced by SASA. Um, the, the, the impact on the department apart from that is that it, there was an effect on the budgets of the department in terms of having to shift funds, not only for food relief, but also for PPE and um, for staff. Uh, quite uh, substantial funds were spent on um, sanitizing offices as well uh, and meeting all of the um, uh, very quickly prescribed um, uh, requirements by the public uh, uh, public service uh, and administration department uh, for um, uh, access control uh, in departments. And uh, there was also uh, fairly significant amounts of funds that were provided to the um, to, uh, facilities for older persons, uh, disabled persons, ECDs, uh, and others uh, to uh, for PPE and, and COVID readiness so that they could um, continue their services and reduce the risk to um, the, uh, the, the beneficiaries of those services. Um, in terms of the uh, question from Honourable Member uh, Baku Baku Foss about um, whether we have reported cases of deaths in residential facilities for older persons and measures put in place regarding the second wave, uh, in the first wave, um, we um, we uh, had to deal with uh, a, a major upsurge. Uh, there was about um, nearly uh, around 2,000 uh, infections in in the old age homes across the province, um, and uh, 328 people died. Uh, the that was during the primarily during the first wave of COVID. Um, so there was 328 residents and 16 staff that passed away uh, due to COVID. 
uh, during the second wave now, um, there is uh, approximately 100 uh, 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 cases active in our old age homes at present. We're due to get the latest updates um, uh, on those figures tomorrow. Um, but last week it stood at around 80. Um, so we expect it will be approximately 100 to 120 cases this week if the um, trend continues. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there's once again, we are putting uh, in place uh, the, the um, procedures and safety measures uh, for the old age homes that were put in place last time. They've been given um, uh, all the information they need on COVID safety requirements. Uh, more PPE funding uh, is going to be made available to assist them. Uh, the decision on whether or not to lock down the old age homes, as was done during the lockdown period, um, would have to be taken at a national level in terms of the National Disaster Management Act or Disaster Proclamation, uh, which empowers the National Minister of Social Development and all other ministers to make directions. Uh, previously, the National Minister of Social Development had issued a direction prohibiting visitors to old age homes in order to reduce the risk at those homes. Uh, that was lifted under level one, um, but uh, it's possible that it would be reinstated, but uh, it, is a, it is something that would have to be done um, through that national direction. Uh, the provincial department has recommended to old age homes, particularly in the high risk areas, that they do limit visitors or, or prohibit visitors altogether um, for the safety of residents, but it's not yet an enforceable requirement. Um, the question from Honourable Member Baku Baku Foss um, regarding the, um, the increased demand for services and what creative measures have been put in place to meet demands. Um, I think we spoke a bit earlier about the, uh, the electronic systems that we've used. Um, during COVID-19 uh, lockdown period, we, we had a, a quite a big increase in psychosocial support services being required. And we have provided a presentation to this effect to the standing committee previously. Um, the, there also has been um, a, a uh, increased need for humanitarian relief um, and uh, particularly in the um, level five lockdown period, um, our um, local officers had, had to deal with uh, a, quite an intensive process of, uh, of assessing and uh, people for humanitarian relief and providing that relief, um, which was, was an extremely pressured time for the department. Um, I think the, the, the challenge is that uh, we, when we are not going to be able to expand our staff uh, complement to meet the growing demand uh, for services. And um, we, we, have, we are putting in um, some electronic systems, uh, such as the electronic foster care management system, to try and assist staff uh, with uh, some efficiencies uh, to make things work a little bit quicker. But the nature of social work, unfortunately, involves person-to-person uh, -person work. A lot of the time it involves working with the courts. Uh, so there is, it is not very easy to uh, get around the need for actual social workers um, to meet the demand. So um, the, the, the fortunate aspect is that we are seeing a, um, a amendment to the national legislation pertaining to um, foster care uh, in the form of the amendments to the Children's Act. Um, which will certainly, I think, streamline some of the processes and potentially reduce caseloads on social workers quite significantly uh, because it aims to uh, create an alternative way uh, for uh, the um, family members who are caring for children who are not their own biological children uh, to access the um, a top up grant for child uh, support uh, that is more than the usual child support grant. Um, but which wouldn't require going through the children's court to get a foster care order, which is currently what is happening uh, even in cases where children are not necessarily at risk and need to be put into um, a formal foster care placement. Uh, they are more in need of cash than, than, than anything else. Uh, and, and so if that mechanism is successful, uh, we anticipate there will be a very significant reduction in the um, workload and caseloads of the uh, social workers in our local offices and in the NGOs when it, when it comes to child protection matters. Um, in, in terms of um, ongoing uh, impact of COVID-19, I think we will see um, that shifting 
uh, uh, impacts of COVID and that will have different effects on demand. Uh, we have, for example, now seen a, a rapid upswing in the number of cases uh, coming to the Tutuzela centers of, um, of uh, women who've been victims of GBV and rape. Uh, and um, that is likely to place additional pressure on those uh, areas of service that DST provides. Um, so if this trend continues, um, then that that is an area we're going to we're going to have uh, more and more pressure on. Um, in terms of the question from Honourable Member Philander, uh, how does DST encourage a multi-sectoral approach to GBV? Um, the the minister has spoken, I think, uh, at some length to that issue. Um, but uh, in addition to that, um, the the um, there is also uh, some inputs uh, that I think we can, uh, which, which Mr. Garber, uh, who's the director uh, for that unit, uh, has on, on that issue. Um, so I will also ask Mr. Garber to speak briefly to uh, the multi-sectoral efforts, um, both through the um, provincial uh, um, team that's working on an implementation plan for the national strategic plan and also uh, developments that are occurring in the um, criminal justice space at DEVCOM uh, and so forth. So, Mr. Garber, perhaps you can just uh, provide some further detail there for the committee. Uh, thank you, Chair, Chair, SOD and honorable members. <clears throat> We've got a, a multi-sectoral forum, the Victim Empowerment Forum, that consists of social led by social development, the NPA participates, justice, uh, correctional services, and other government departments. It meets on a quarterly basis, and also it involves NPOs, such as the shelter movement, the rape crisis, and also business unit that represents the business sector. So this forum receives reports regularly when it meets and uh, unlocks operational bottlenecks. There's also a DEFCOM, the Development Committee, which is basically a policy-making body that coordinates the involvement of government departments on these issues of uh, uh, crime prevention and uh, also uh, ensuring that uh, cases are prosecuted. And there's also the Child Justice Forum. So all of these bodies work together and we also invite academic institutions. For example, we work with uh, the, the Institute of Security Studies that has actually helped us to transform the VP Forum and make it a more agile body that is responsive to issues on the ground. Hence, we have been in a position to respond in our view, we believe effectively to the COVID pandemic and also to work virtually with our sectors throughout this process. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Garber. Um, and then finally, I think the, the question of um, the amendments of legislation, uh, there is a lot of legislation in the pipeline at the moment in the national legislature, uh, which speaks to GVV. Uh, the most significant for the Department of Social Development being the Victim Support Services Bill. Um, and the DSD has been actively involved in the shaping of that bill. Uh, we have been lobbying as well for certain changes because there are some aspects of the bill that we are concerned about, uh, particularly the um, clauses that uh, aim to punish uh, um, non-reporters of GBV, um, given the, the, the unintended consequences we believe are likely to stem from that. Um, and uh, the, uh, of course, we've also been involved with the um, uh, commenting and, and making inputs to the domestic violence amendments uh, and, and other acts that are currently uh, before the legislature. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that covers the, our responses to the first round of questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much um, to the Minister, the HOD, as well as Mr. Hill. Um, that was quite a, co a comprehensive response. Um, members, I'm just going to ask if there's anything that piqued a follow-up um, from any of you, if you could just raise your hand. Nothing from my side, Jefferson. Jefferson? Yes, Member Van Poffel? 
Yeah, I just wanted to know on the gender-based violence um, uh, campaign, um, what is the update and then uh, of the campaign? And, and then how do the antisanas from a rural area of farm uh, get involved or benefit from this campaign? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Then I'm done. Thank you, Member Bankwoha. Uh, Member Philander. Um, voorzitter, baie dankie. Chepes, and just for, for clarity um, from my side um, through you. Um, the HOD made mention of an um, implementation plan that will be rolled out early next year. And um, the last speaker made mention on the operations of the multi-sectoral forum. Um, Chepes, and I just need clarity on the color. Um, how does the two gel? And um, also on the various departments that are involved, um, where does the go local government sector fit in as the government closest to the people? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I'm now going to, I, I see Minister Plant. <laughs> May I speak, or was there another follow-up question? I see Member Baku Baku Force. Um, Member Baku Baku Force, do you want to go before I give the Minister an opportunity? Yes, Chairperson, but I'm not sure if uh, we are continuing to ask the questions or the, you are asking for the follow-up question. I'm asking if there's any follow-up to those rounds at the moment. Okay, no, at the moment. I, I will reserve my question. Thank you, Chair. I okay. do have questions. Okay, Minister, I'm going to hand over to you now and to the HOD. Thank you, Honourable Chairperson, and to the members. I will just provide again the brief overview. We have continued to use webinars during lockdown to maintain contact with our uh, GBV sector. So we have possibly, I would imagine, hosted about six or eight webinars in this last little while. And it would include the shelter, let's say, in Deiselstorf or the Tani in, um, in Marysburg or wherever, Matsikam, wherever it might be. I also just last week attended the launch of a second gender-based command council number, which was launched by the National Woman Shelter, and it is actually based, we have social workers based at Sarki Bartman, and it is a second number to support the National GBV Command Center number in terms of uh, fighting gender-based violence. When it comes to uh, communities, local communities, um, Salga has the Salga Women's Commission, I know, but um, we do have um, communities. We have, uh, I think Debbie's on the call. We have MOUs with most each, most of the municipalities. And in all our MOUs, we are specific around the establishment of a functioning local drug action committee. And I can confirm that with my jo my visit to George and Oatsong just on a month ago, um, I was actually informed that in the Southern Cape they have established their gender forum and it is up and running with all stakeholders. So um, municipalities have what is called the Local Drug Action Committee and many of them have in incorporated GBV into that space and in certain municipalities, they have done it as a separate entity. We are reviewing as our MOUs come up for a review with municipalities. I have directed or asked that there be a specific focus on gender-based violence in each MOU as well as the ALDEX. So I think that talks to that briefly, but we must, honorable members, there is a lot 
of activity behind the scenes. Uh, many of you would have heard that we finally got to sign up to our MOU with the National Department of Public Works. That was signed on the 29th of October. It now um, creates the opportunity for six shelters to be set up and established in the rural areas. But again, all of that will form part of this new reporting period, but I think it is important for you to know. And right now, as we speak, the Premier is conducting a conversation with men in senior management on a webinar as a closing out for, because today we close out on the 16 days, and as a recommendation from our transversal GBB working group, the, president, the Premier accepted the call and said we need to start engaging um, males within government to better understand gender, gender sensitivity, and all the other related matters to that. Unfortunately, it is taking place at the same time as we are in this, dis this discussion. So uh, we, we are missing out on that one. But uh, that too is another effort to ensure that we don't just focus on the external, but that we focus on the internal work. Our um, Dr. Heidi Sauls was on the radio with uh, Teba Davids. Many of you would know Sister, who did the stand-up call for men after a, a musician mo allegedly molested a young child. And she has participated for three Wednesday evenings and we are possibly looking at building stronger partnerships there. But where we are right now, it is about creating partnerships with groups, working groups on the ground to ensure that they are the first responders and that we can then come in and assist. We are looking at um, a overnight team because many of you know our officials belong to unions, they have working hours, and most cases of gender-based violence take place after hours, on weekends, on SASA pay days and month ends. And the idea would be to engage with civil society and the sector and to try and get a team established that can work the night shift as if it were so that we can be responsive and address the actual issues. I am certain that Mr. Garba and Ms. Corson would have additional input, Chair, but again, that is just to keep members appraised of what is currently happening, because uh, I am concerned when we deal with historical issues, you know, that was in the past, how do we empower members with the knowledge of what is currently taking place today? And I've just tried to create that context. Through you, Chair, I'll hand over to Dr. Robert McDonald. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister um, and Chairperson. I think the uh, Minister's covered a lot of that, but also just to mention that um, the, uh, the gender-based violence uh, work that's being done uh, on the implementation plan is uh, is, is going to be involving um, all of the um, municipal players as well, because uh, the first, once the, the implementation plan framework is set up, um, we'll be getting inputs from uh, the municipalities uh, via the, um, the safety, uh, well-being and dignity uh, and, uh, and other um, forums where the uh, municipalities are working with the provincial government. Uh, so uh, there's going to be uh, the opportunity there um, to work quite closely with them on the content of the, um, the uh, implementation plan. Um, the, the forums that have been set up uh, are, are variously going to be involved with um, uh, are, are going to be involved with the um, implementation and monitoring of the implementation as well, particularly through uh, the hotspots that have been set up uh, where particular um, GBV uh, items have been uh, in, uh, have been added 
to the reporting um, process for those hotspots. Uh, and the hotspots are uh, attended by the municipalities in the area um, that they're involved with. So uh, in terms of the implementation plan, the, the first phase is to develop the plan to get uh, the inputs from all the stakeholders, including local, local government, uh, and then um, consult it with the sector, the NGO sector, as well as um, all other uh, role players, uh, including Salga and, and local municipalities, and uh, thereafter implement the, the, the plan uh, with the aid of the joint district approach, uh, which is currently known as the hotspot approach um, uh, as part of the recovery plan and uh, also through the various forums such as the uh, substance abuse forums that the minister mentioned and uh, the other forums such as DEVCOM uh, where we work with um, justice. Uh, that, that really underscores the importance of having an implementation plan because there are many uh, stakeholders and there are a number of different forums where these, um, uh, these or where there are touch points between uh, the different departments and uh, government agencies uh, and we need a common understanding of what we're going to do and a common understanding of our objectives. Uh, I think the national strategic plans provided a much needed and very welcome framework uh, that everyone can be guided by whether it's provinces, municipalities, uh, the police and the criminal justice system uh, and the NGO sector but uh, it does require much more detail in terms of how we're going to take it forward and that's the intention that we have uh, and that is precisely with the aim to make um, the the different um, uh, activities gel as far as possible. So uh, the, the other question uh, relating to um, the uh, rural uh, impact of the GBV campaign and the GBV uh, implementation uh, plan is, uh, is I think, uh, supported by that, and that is where the joint district approach is going to be an important enabler. Uh, but of course, we do, as social development, have a presence as well uh, in the all of those local areas, uh, in, in rural areas, with our local offices and with the funded organizations we work with in those areas. And um, the Department of Social Development has also been appointed by the uh, Western Cape Provincial Cabinet uh, to be the lead uh, on GBV. Uh, so um, our local offices and their participation in the joint district um, um, forums and the, or the hotspot forums, uh, they will locally be um, uh, spearheading uh, GBV efforts uh, and pulling it together uh, at a local level once the implementation plan has been approved and adopted and agreed to by um, all parties. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McDonald, and thank you very much to, to the minister as well. Members, I'm now going to ask for uh, a last uh, round on part A, and I also just want to check um, if there's any members of the public who would like to ask anything on part A of the report, if you can also just let me know. Um, I know Member Baku Baku Force had a question still on part A, which covers pages five to 31. Member Baku Baku Force, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, sir. As I said before, I came into the meeting very late. I was not sure uh, which part we are, but I just asked the question that was uh, the priority. But I, I'm not sure if I can still ask from uh, page 10. Is it possible? Yes, you may. Thank you, Chair. You can go ahead, Member Baku Baku Force. Chair? Yeah. Oh, Member Baku Baku Force. On page 10. In paragraph three, the fifth sentence that the department is saying, finally, the approval by the provincial cabinet and the sub 
subsequent implementation of the department's child murder prevention and reduction plan paved the way for a more coordinated response to this couch between key stakeholders such as South African police, the criminal justice cluster and various provincial and local government departments. I would like to ask the question there. That what are the uh, details of the reduction plan? And how has it improved the situation of child murders in the province? And the second question is that what is the breakdown of child murders in the province for the year under review? And what programs are in place to address it? And uh, the last one from uh, page 10 uh, is as follows. What other stakeholders are involved in the involvement of this plan? Uh, NPOs and other parents organization involved. Uh, thank you, Chair. And the last question, uh, uh, the second question still from um, page 10. The last paragraph, the first sentence is as follows, the importance of integrated children and family programs was confirmed in September 2019, when the department convened a workshop of all stakeholders, which working together developed, developed a draft Western Cape government prevention and early intervention strategy for children and families in the province. My question, Chair, here is that what are the contents of this draft to Western Cape Government Prevention and Aid Intervention Strategy for Children and Families? And can a draft of this strategy be sent to the committee? Um, the last question from um, paragraph uh, page 10 is as follows. Is still in the last um, um, the last sentence. This coupled with the program focus on rehabilitating, reunifying, and integrate, integrating homeless adults with their families and communities of origin has extended and scope of the department service of to families at risk. We, with respect to the last mentioned, the number of uh, of subsidized beds in shelters for homeless were also expanded. My question on this matter is that what is the number of homeless people in the province and how many were integrated with their families. What is the nature of these regions? What has been done to investigate reports that homeless are changed daily fees to access shelters? Because it concerns me, Chairperson, how could we charge uh, fees for the for, for, for the homeless? Remember, the homeless, some of them don't have uh, a job and um, but still we are charging them uh, fees in the shelters. So I would like the department to look at that. Thank you, Chair. And that was the last question in, in, in paragraph 10. Can I move to paragraph 11? Uh, yes, you may move to page 11. Okay. The last paragraph in page 11, I would like to, 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 to be taken by the department um, about um, the awareness created by hashtag enough is enough campaign contributed to the increased number of victims of sexual offenses and domestic violence ac uh, accessing psychosocial support over the last year. So my question in this regard I would like to know what is the number of GBV cases that were reported during the year under review and how many victims were assisted 
by the department, including the details of support received. How many of these victims came from the GBV hotspot areas? What are the plans of the department to expand fundings and build more shelters in the GPV hotspot? Remember, I've been asking um, the department to, 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 to increase number of shelters in our, pro, uh, in our province. As we all know, uh, uh, GPV is the second pandemic in our province. So really, we need to increase shelter so that we can um, accommodate our our victims so that they can become survivors. Yeah, so I would like to know if they, if they, expand, they expand funding and build more shelters in the GPV hotspot where majority of, of victims are residing. Like in the rural areas, township, we know that's where we get more GPV cases. And what is the update with regards to properties received for national government for GPV shelters? When will this operational? When will be well will this be operational? What is the number of additional beds and emergency beds that were activated? Thank you, Chair. That was my last question. Um yeah. Thank you very much, Member Bakubaku Kos. I'll hand over to the department. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I wasn't sure if the Minister wanted to say something first. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to, to respond. You may proceed, HOD. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Um, so in terms of the first question um, from Honourable Member Baku Baku Fox, uh, the Child Murder Reduction Plan um, and the, the question for details uh, of the Murder Reduction Program, um, the the plan was um, formulated uh, and consulted with um, the um, uh, with a, a wide range of stakeholders, including the in the criminal justice system, all provincial departments, local government, uh, as well as the NGO sector. Um, it, it essentially um, is aiming to uh, uh, to sharpen the response of um, the, the province to the increase numbers of child murders that have been um, picked up over the years. Um, I think the, the most, the, or the key role players would be the Department of Social Development, um, the SEPs uh, and the criminal justice system and the Department of Health, uh, as well as the Department of Education. Um, the, the, uh, the, some of the key interventions include um, the, the establishment of uh, the child death review panels under the Department of Health, uh, with the Department of Social Development uh, being um, a member of those death review panels, uh, and then uh, the department being uh, responsible to then follow up on cases of uh, where, where uh, children have been murdered and it appears that the system has uh, failed them, uh, and also to follow up where a child has been murdered uh, to, on the safety of other children in the same home. Uh, to to make sure that they are not also at risk, uh, as well as um, the introduction of um, an inspectorate at the Department of Social Development to follow up on cases of alleged neglect and malpractice by um, social workers, whether they are in the Department of Social Development or whether they are in the NGO sector, um, so that we can address cases where the system has failed children. Um, there, there has, of course, since been the appointment of the Children's Commissioner as well. That was not something that was um, included in the Child Murder Reduction Plan, but it certainly supports it um, in terms of providing an additional level of oversight. Um, the plan also includes um, a, a whole process of uh, uh, creating a, a surveillance uh, and, and uh, early warning system for children at risk uh, through the use of the Eye, of the, Eye on the Child program. Uh, as well as um, the increased uh, or the, the uh, um, uh, improved uh, coordination mechanisms between the Department of Social Development and schools that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, and that is something that's in process of being implemented at the moment. Um, the, I think the, 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 the plan itself has previously been made available to the Standing Committee. I would be happy to um, provide a copy again if, if requested to do so. Um, 
in terms of uh, statistics on child murders for the year, um, we would uh, need that question writing because we'd have to get the, um, the exact period uh, and, and then gather that information uh, from uh, the, uh, the Department of Health's uh, forensic pathology services. So uh, I, I wouldn't be able to give you an answer straight away. It, it would require a written question. Um, the the question about how we intend to reduce it, I think that is what the child murder reduction program is about. But in addition, that needs to be seen in the context of um, the broader plan, uh, the safety plan of the province, because what we have found is that the child murders coincide broadly with the um, levels of violent crime in the province and the hotspots for child murders also correlate um, with the um, the wards in the province that have the highest murder rates, as do the um, GBV statistics. So those GBV hotspots um, are also child murder hotspots, and they're also generally uh, murder hotspots. Um, so there is a significant uh, effort being made at the moment to get additional uh, policing capacity into the um, crime hotspots in the province. And um, the Department of Social Development is also a key partner in that respect because uh, where we've been putting in uh, uh, the extra policing or, or enforcement capacity through the LEAP deployment, uh, it is also being accompanied by uh, the deployment of additional capacity by the Department of Social Development, for example, in the Isibindi program, uh, where community-based child and youth care workers are being uh, uh, placed um, through NGOs into those communities to also assist children at risk. So that it isn't just a policing approach, but it is also a, um, a social development um, intervention uh, and a violence reduction intervention. So it, it is a multi-pronged approach. Um, I think the, the child murders um, uh, strategy was put together, uh, or plan of action rather, was put together uh, before the new term of office began and before the new um, uh, safety plan was introduced. So there is some overlap there. Um, as also there is with the um, the gang um, strategy, um, which was nationally adopted and which the province created a uh, provincial response, uh, uh, which which also speaks to some uh, similar overlapping um, priorities as well. Uh, the 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 bulk of the child murders numbers in the province are gang related, um, and that's what results in the province having very high um, child murder rates. Um, particularly in the um, teenage um, uh, age groups uh, where we've got uh, under 18 youth involved in gang activity. So that does account for the, the majority of the child murder cases. Uh, so so the addressing gang activity is, is key to addressing child murders. Um, in terms of um, the other stakeholders involved in the plan, I think I did mention that we, we have taken it into the prop joints and, and um, DEVCOM context with um, justice, SAPS, uh, and correctional services, and the prosecuting authority have all been involved in that process as well, um, and also the local government, Metro Police, uh, and so forth. I think the, the, the question about the uh, prevention and early intervention strategy for children and families, what are the contents of this strategy and, and uh, can a draft be given to the committee? Um, I will ask Mr. Jordan, um, uh, who's the Chief Director for uh, Children, Families and ECD to speak to that uh, briefly. Okay, thank you very much, um, Chair and OCD. Just very briefly on the PEI strategy. We've embarked on that process already in 2019, consulting various stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And the focus is looking at a continuum, continuum a range of services for children and families within that environment. So if you look at specific programs, it can be anything from what kinds of warning signs you see within a family that's at risk or a child that's at risk. And then looking at all of those kind of programs that we can strengthen with all our various partners, such as Department of Health, Education, SAPS, Justice, um, Home Affairs, and all of those kinds of role players. This will include the municipalities as well. So it's it's quite a focused approach. Um, the strategy is in its draft, and we can make it available for committee members if you want to look at more of the issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jordan. Um, the question relating to homeless adults, 
Um, I, I will ask uh, Mr. Jordan to speak to the, to that question as well. Uh, what is the number of homeless people in the province, uh, and how many were inter reintegrated for the year, and also what has been done to address um, access to shelters by homeless in terms of the issue of fees being charged? Uh, Mr. Jordan, perhaps can you assist with that? Yes, no, thank you very much, Ashley. Um, yeah, the latest statistics we have not been have not been released yet by the city of Cape Town, but the last statistics I've seen from the city of Cape Town, and they are the ones responsible for that, um, specifically in the metro areas, um, was about 4,800 homeless people. Um, the figures um, for the province was at one stage about almost 8,000 for the whole of the province. I know at one stage there was numbers of 14,000 going around. That 14,000 was numbers during lockdown, which is not under the review of this report. So there's various processes that's been put in place um, with regards to accessing shelters for the homeless. Um, there is currently funded by this department 1,499 bed spaces. That excludes um, the shelters that the City of Cape Town and other various um, organisations are funding as well. Um, there is also a few organisations that's private shelters that's not been funded by the department since they have not applied for funding, but we are supporting them on all norms and standards. Um, in the year of under review, we um, have processes in place specifically for the reunification of homeless people. And the number we have achieved was 700 plus minus 700 for the achievement of reunification of adults um, to their families. I must also add that the process of reunification is also a very complex process. So it's a whole process of psychosocial support to the individual, looking at how to assess any pathologies the person has, might it be psychological, might it be substance abuse or any other aspects. And then the whole process is starting where we have actually appointed social workers that works at the shelters specifically with the homeless people. There is also various job opp opportunity creation processes, skills development processes, and then also the families are contacted um, to in order to ensure the reunification. Sadly, it sometimes happens that the homeless person themselves do not want to return to the family. Might it be due to conflict on the personal level? Might it be due to any other kind of issues? But the social workers from the NGO sector and our, our own social workers do work quite, quite strongly on this whole matter. Um, going forward, it is a very um, concerning aspect for the province and municipalities in general in the Western Cape province with regards to um, access for the homeless. And for that reason, we are right now, although it's not under the, re the year of review, we are now in process of um, uh, adding additional bed spaces. So the additional bed spaces would be... Sorry, can I just quickly, I've got background noise here, so let me just quickly shift here, if you don't mind, Jay. Okay. No problem. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, the question on, the issue on the homeless for right now, so we're looking at additional bed spaces. So right now we are um, looking at about at least 307 bed spaces to be added, and that includes the rural areas um, and the metro areas. We're also looking at appointing more social workers, we're looking at um, appointing more skills creations, and then also we've got a specific shelter, homeless shelter for, for women and their children that's got absolutely no place to go to um, and that do not fit into the GBV environment because they've not been abused or have been a victim of trauma, um, but it's people that just due to their circumstances, they've landed up um, in a very difficult situation. So we've got a specific shelter for that as well, and we're the only shelter, as far as I know, in South Africa that has a family shelter for single women and their children. So that is also one achievement that the department did in collaboration with, with the NGO sector specifically. Um, I think I have answered everything I should do. Did I miss out something? Um, no, I think uh, I think that was uh, that was everything. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Um, okay. The, the last question was relating to um, the, the Enough is Enough campaign and the, num and the question on the number of GBV cases reported during the year under review uh, and how many victims access support from DSD, how many came from GBV hotspot areas, uh, what are DSD's plans to build shelters in hotspot areas 
and what is the update on properties received from National Public Works and what is the number of additional emergency beds activated. Um, some of that statistical information may not be immediately available, but I'll, I'll check with the programs to see whether they can assist with that. Uh, but maybe just to, to uh, add what, what I can now, and that is that firstly with the um, six properties that, uh, that were made available to the Department of Social Development from uh, or by the National Department of Trans or Public Work and, and Infrastructure, um, those six properties were um, signed over um, in um, late uh, late this year. I think it was in um, November that um, the, the um, MOU was signed by the National DG or Acting National DG of um, Public Works and Infrastructure. Um, the properties have uh, are in in some instances uh, have some issues in terms of needing. Uh, some further work um, for them to be ready to be used. Um, some of the properties are um, in not a very good condition, so th so there is some work that needs to be done. Um, there's also some that will need extra toilets um, and other things. Uh, the Department of Social Development is um, has uh, uh, reached agreement uh, and um, started uh, with uh, funding of uh, organisations to operationalise the shelters. And those organizations will also be involved in setting the shelters up in terms of getting beds, uh, mattresses, and all of the other necessary equipment to furnish those shelters. Um, so we're expecting them to be able to start taking clients early in the new year um, uh, and uh, uh, as soon as they are able to uh, deal with some of the minor infrastructure adjustments and, and maintenance work that is required to ensure that the shelters are in, or the buildings are inhabitable. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the, the uh, facilities will be able to um, start accommodating people um, as soon as that's done. Uh, in terms of building um, shelters in hotspot areas, uh, I think the, the, it, it's often not desirable to actually have a shelter right in the hotspot area itself um, because it needs to be a place where um, the victims of GBV can actually get away from uh, the, uh, the, the, the alleged uh, abusers or perpetrators of GBV. Um, and also in some areas, uh, if, if there is too much um, violence and, and disruption in the community, um, the organizations can't actually function properly because um, they, uh, there, there is, it becomes too dangerous. Um, we, we have already seen incidents where um, uh, women who are in um, shelters have, have then been exposed to further violence in the community uh, when going to the shop or um, uh, leaving the premises. So often it is better that the shelter is not actually in the hotspot area, but what we do need is, is shelters that service those areas. Um, and um, I think uh, the, uh, that, that has been the aim of the department to ensure that shelters are established in the areas where the need is greatest. Uh, there's still a long way to go with that. I think we've said in previous years as well um, that um, the establishment of shelters for victims of gender-based violence is not actually yet a, a legislated or statutory function. There's no registration requirement for those shelters at this stage. Um, the Victim Support Services Bill uh, will change that, um, which is a good thing, um, but uh, that bill is still some way off. Uh, but the, um, the the budget for victim support services under the um, uh, VEP program in the department has been rapidly increasing, um, but it's certainly not yet in a situation where we we are able to meet the full need for these services. Um, I think it's uh, we are quite some way away from that, um, but we are rolling out new sites um, as fast as we can and within the money that we get um, that becomes available for this purpose. Um, the, so in terms of the question of um, the addition, additional emergency beds activated, um, I will ask um, uh, Ms. Huerson and Mr. Garber, uh, maybe Mr. Garber will be able to assist with that, uh, what, uh, on the numbers of emergency beds activated during the lockdown. Um, and then also um, uh, the, the question of um, the number of victims access, accessing support from the social development and the number of GPV cases um, reported, those statistics which uh, we would need to provide a written response. Uh, we do also, though, of course, have 
um, the number of um, victims uh, accessing funded DSD services reported in our performance information uh, in the um, annual report. But I'll ask Mr. Garber to indicate whether he's got the numbers for the number of additional emergency beds activated um, during the lockdown period. Um, sorry, Mr. Garber, you, are you there? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Garber. Uh, during lockdown, five, set, uh, 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 five sectors uh, were earmarked to absorb uh, suspected victims of COVID and uh, were quarantined for 14 days where they were assessed, they were screened before they moved to, to other sort of uh, services. So, that uh, ensured that uh, we increased uh, uh, the availability of bed spaces available in, in the metro because before lockdown, the beds that are available were available to bed spaces, they were 365. And uh, also, as part of responding to the question in terms of these uh, hotspot areas, we, we should appreciate that uh, all these hotspot areas. They are in the metropolitan area. And of the 16 centers we have as BP, 10 are in the metropolitan areas, which means that they cover the catchment areas of hotspots. So there's no pressing need to build additional centers in these areas. So that's why the ones we have received from public works, they are appropriately located in the, in the rural uh, areas. So, Essentially, what it means as, a, as an impact of this hash bills, I mean, hash uh, no more, it stops with me. It means that we have exceeded our target by 7,372. Not only that, because there was an increase of reported cases to get protection orders. And then it means that we had to increase that by 5.6%. Uh, that is uh, the, the, our target in that area. So it was it was an increase. So and also this increase was also influenced by the activities undertaken by social workers uh, in the in the shelters. For example, where targets were exceeded by 1,963, and also in uh, GPV educational workshops facilitated by NPOs, where target reached there were 4,129. So, so essentially, uh, it was a combination of uh, our own work and the work undertaken by civil society that put additional pressure on, on the department. And we see going forward, more resources will be required as more people come into the open to register their cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Garber. Um, Chairperson, that um, that's, uh, concludes our responses to that round of questions. Thank you very much. Um, Member Vindvogel, I see your hand is up. Um, after Member Vindvogel, colleagues, I'd like to propose that we take a, a short comfort break to allow people to just stretch their legs and to refill their coffee cups. Uh, but Member Vindvogel, do you want to go first? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chair Mines, on page 14, um, point of reference is table B. Uh, here I want to know from the HSB or MEC, uh, what are the reasons for the under expenditure and um, how much of this relates to compensation of employees, including the number of posts not filled? And if we move to page 31, the old pentagram, and also point of reference is vacant code, uh, uh, what are the reasons for the vacancies and, 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 and what is the progress? Um, as, as, what progress has been made with regards to the to filling them? Uh, and yeah, what are the plans to increase African uh, representation on the senior top management? Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Member Van Vorhoek. Dr. McDonald, I just wanted to check, um, do, are you uh, okay with holding that response for until we come back from the break, or would you prefer to give it now? Um, I don't mind, uh, whatever the uh, Honourable Chairperson's preference is. Actually, you know, let's, let's do it now, and then when we come back from the break, we will have concluded with Part A, and we'll move over to Part B. Um, so you can respond to that now, sir. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the reasons for under-expenditure, um, I will ask the CFO to um, speak to that, uh, that question. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> thank you, um, HOD, and thank you, uh, Honourable Chairperson. Um, in terms of the under-expenditure of $29 million, as as can be seen by the members also that it is um, um, divided into the various programs. And I will quickly take um, everyone through these um, um, underspending per program. Um, in, in most cases and in all the programs, I can also indicate that our, our COE um, underspending is mainly due to the defining of suitable candidates, the internal promotions, staff exits um, that resulted in, in, in the underspending of, of COE. And as we know, um, Chairperson, um, you know, it takes a month uh, for somebody to resign um, and it takes uh, more than a month uh, up to three to, to, to six months to, to fill a post. And that lag time also results in, 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 in underspending in itself. So, so for program one, um, the 7.8 million there, 6.6 um, .6 of that uh, is in terms of compensation of employees, the, the, the underspend, and as I've explained the, the reasons, um, and uh, Ms. Ms. Van Rienen can also give more details if, if, if necessary. And then um, the 1.1 million that makes up the 7.8 million is in terms of a research project um, which started um, um, late in, in that financial year. Um, and we had to secure a service provider, and that was for the substance abuse um, um, research project um, in, in, in that year. So we basically started then um, with some spending in, in, in March of that year, and then we concluded the rest of, of that project in, in, in the current um, financial year. In, in program two, mainly, again, there, um, the underspend of 17 million, um, mainly due to the sanitary and uh, dignity uh, project. Um, again, there, uh, Chairperson, we had a situation where we had to advertise um, our tender uh, process twice. The first round, um, we could not um, get um, the um, to to. Um, the qualifying bids, um, there was uh, none that qualified at that at that point, and then we redid the tender um, later in the year, and then we could only finalize that tender in February, and uh, we awarded the tender, and then um, our first payment of of ten million um, was done in 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 March, so so that. Um, so 13 million of that 17 million relates to um, um, the sanitary dignity project and and the rest of the spending um, was done in the in the new year then. Um, the other part of that, which is the 3,7 million, is relating to that special adapted vehicles um, and the HOD has already responded to that that um, also, the dependence that we have on public works to make sure that the uh, modification of these vehicles are done. And we could only um, complete two of the four, and therefore we had to then also um, underspend on, on the 3.7 million. 
that um, will now be be concluded in, in, in this financial year. In program three, um, the underspending there again was mainly the one million was due to the um, COE uh, in terms of internal promotions and staff exits, as as indicated earlier. Program four, there we have the situation of the three million, and uh, again um, the part on COE is two point two million, and then eight hundred and thirty five thousand rand. Is, is due to the, the delay um, for um, acquiring the office furniture and equipment for our secure care um, um, facilities um, at that point in time with, with, with Horizon and, and Plain William that we've insourced. And then lastly, again, um, 257,000 relates to the underspending on COE in itself. So in total, Chair, that makes up the 29 million that um, that was underspent for that financial year. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, CFO. Yeah, I think the, the what we also did with that underspend is that um, we 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 had there were some options of how to deal with it, but uh, we were able to roll it over um, uh, for immediate use for the food relief um, during COVID uh, lockdown. So um, that those funds were almost entirely used uh, in in the um, first uh, quarter of the new financial year um, to to assist us with the additional food parcels, um, uh, fifty thousand food parcels that were distributed. Um, so uh, I think the the funds were well used. Um, but um, the, the reasons for the vacancies and the slow filling of posts, I think the CFO has alluded to that already, um, but the, the, the general challenge is uh, in many instances that um, where we appoint people in posts, uh, it's often internal candidates, so then when you fill a post, you create a vacancy at the same time, uh, and it's never predictable whether you're going to have an internal candidate appointed or whether it's going to be an external candidate, so you never quite know whether you're going to be sitting with um, uh, underspending. So see, a compensation budget is always unpredictable. Um, and unfortunately, because of cost containment measures that have been put in place by Treasury um, due to the financial crunch that government is facing, um, we are not able to reprioritize that those um, compensation funds to other purposes. Um, so we usually have to surrender that. Um, fortunately for this year, though, we didn't need to surrender it. We were able to roll it over and use it for food relief. Um, in terms of the uh, question around what measures are in place to increase African representativity in the top management uh, of the department, um, I will ask uh, Ms. Van Rienen to give some outline of the employment equity processes that the department follows. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, HOD. We do have an employment equity, equity plan in the department, uh, and we work towards those targets. Um, specifically, the question that was asked around the, 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 the African representation on senior management. Currently, our gender and, and, and um, balance is we've got 52% um, females in senior management and 48% males. 52% of senior management is um, color, uh, white 35 and African 13%. What we do is we've got targeted interventions in terms of recruitment and selection, um, advertising broad to um, make sure that we read the uh, specific targets. What we are struggling as a department in general is the we've got overrepresentation in terms of females due to the nature of the profession, which was in previous years predominantly um, females. So we had a bursary program for males, um, which um, wasn't really successful. Um, from the, the, the 12 that we had, we only had two that eventually um, uh, became successful in becoming a social worker. So that's one of the, the challenges. We've also approached the council to assist us with um, lists so when the post is advertised, we've, we've got, I've got a team that sends the, the advertisements to them and guide them in terms of applying for um, the post. But we do struggle specifically to get the, the, the males in the, in the profession. 
Um, we also um, got engagement with the disability sector to also look at how we can increase that. Um, .p used to have a database, they no longer have it, so we started building our own ones. Um, and the, the, the HR component specifically in the HUD's office works directly with the program disability and uh, assist them to make sure that we, we increase the targets. Um, thank you, HUD. Thank you very much, Ms. Van Rienen. Uh, and that uh, covers our responses to those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, we are now going to take a 15 minute break. Uh, we'll uh, be back at half past. Can I please ask that you do not log off from the call, but you merely just mute yourself or mute the screen and um, we'll see you back here at half past 10. Thank you, Che. Thank you, Che.
colleagues, it's now 10.30. Are we all back yet? Yes, Chairperson, we are here. Thank you, Member McKenzie. Um, other members and colleagues from the department, are you here? Yes, Chairperson, I am present and I'm certain most of the colleagues are on the platform. Thank you. Chair, Chairperson, I just need to uh, alert you to the fact that my computer is about to do a forced restart. Um, so I'm, I'll, I'll unfortunately be thrown out and then I'll have to come back in again. Uh, Dr. McDonald, we'll give you um, a few minutes just to, to restart. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Apologies for the inconvenience. any questions in writing which we can then facilitate an answer to which can go through to him. Um, I know Mr Mbiko is a very passionate community activist who joins us um, regularly. Members, the HOD is back. We're now going to move to um, part B of the report, which is the performance information, and that's on pages um, 32 to 100. Um, Members, if you can give me an indication of 
um, whether you'd like to pose a question. I see Member Baku Baku Force's hand is up. Member Baku Baku Force. Thank you, Chair. Chair, no, I just want uh, an invitation from you. Um, I entered late in the meeting. Which uh, uh, pages that we can start from now? So we are now on pages 32 to 100. So that's part B of the report. Okay, so I can't ask any question from 18 now. We concluded um, pages five to to thirty one earlier. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, members, are there anybody who would like to uh, take the first bite of the cherry on uh, part B? I see, member. Baku Baku Force, your hand is still up. Do you want to go first? My hand, Chairperson. And then Member McKenzie. Can I ask, Chair? Yes, you can. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to ask uh, in page 32, Chair, uh, about the service deliver environment. The department delivers service to the most vulnerable um, it's increasing levels of violence against women and children, gang violence, substance abuse, high employment, food insecurities, and nutrition, malnutrition. So my question is as follows, Chair. What programs does the department have to address food insecurity? Is there a possibility to partner with the Department of Agriculture for Households and Community Gardens? What is the number of NEET? NEET is A N E E T. And the following um, message is also on page 32. In the last paragraph, Chair, uh, I would like um, as the analysis of the quarterly labor force data indicated that 31% of youth aged 15 from 15 to 34 years or do we not employed, not in education or training. So I would love to know what programs are there to assist this group. Does the department support the idea of the universal basic income grant proposed by the national government? And the third question that, uh, that I have shared is on, para, uh, is on page 33, the first, the first paragraph. And the department is saying they are improving learners retrenching. 14% of the children in the province drop out of school by the age of 16 and along the West Coast, more than 22% of youth dropped out of school by the age of 16 years. In, in that regard, I would love to ask what are the reasons for the high dropouts um, for the children under the age of uh, 16 and what measures are put in place to address the challenge and what is the impact of this on the work of the department and how many of these children end up in CYCCs. And the last question from that paragraph is that has the department engaged WCED regarding programs to prevent the dropouts rate for the children? That's my last question in paragraph, uh, in the first paragraph. But the second paragraph, my question is as follows. Still, we are in the, on page 33. Uh, my question is as follows. Um, as the department last sentence, they are saying the department continued with its current base funding and earmarked allocation to shelters for abuse women and their children victims of human trafficking and victims of sexual violence. My question is as follows, what is the update of the upgrading of properties received from national government to be used as shelters for GBV victims? 
what are the plans to build shelters in the GP Vosport areas? Hence, uh, I was given earlier uh, the idea of the strategy that uh, uh, the department is busy with. But can they, 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 they elaborate that? Because I didn't do the second, uh, uh, the follow up question, and where the majority of victims, uh, where, where are the majority of victims are residing? I would love to know that also. And the third paragraph in the, uh, still on the page 33, the last sentence, the department is saying in that, um, in the last uh, sentence, uh, they, co they are continuing to support the registered substance abuse treatment and rehabilitation initiatives. And they will roll out service to rural areas, especially in the West Coast Garden Road and Karu District municipalities. <laughs> but what is the number of what is the number of substance? Sorry, Chair, about that. What is the number of substance abuse treatment and rehabilitation initiative that are supported by the department? Are the plans to increase the number of funded initiative given the the rising numbers of of, of drug related crimes in the province? Um, as we know, um, we have a lot of crime and gang related um, crimes in in our pro, in our province, and it, it's always increasing. So uh, uh, um, let me pause there, Chair. I will come back later for 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 the second for the second bite. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Member McKenzie. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, on page thirty-six, it talks about NPOs not complying, um, and then it talks about corrective plans. I refer to the DSD's ICB unit. Uh, what sort of corrective plans are discussed with the NPOs? And can we just get an indication, what are they not complying with? Is it just administratively, or is it perhaps to matters that has happened at the NPO? And then on page number 39, uh, when we talk about 58% that passed, that means 42% did not pass the screening and the vetting, uh, and I'm here to talk, uh, talking about safety and foster parents. If we can just get some indication as to what were the exact reasons that the 42% did not pass. I know it could be suitability related and some obviously safety, and I saw some of the reasons. But I'm just trying to get an indication. Is our recruitment process not working? Or is our screening process so effective that we root out those that don't deserve to be there? And what do we doing what is our plans to ensure that we have enough um, safety and uh, foster parents to ensure that children are not obviously negatively affected. And one of the NPOs that was cancelled, Chairperson, I think it was that did not comply, and I'm trying to get the name of the NPO quickly, uh, uh, that was screened out 2018 or 2019. What happened to those kids? at that NPO, I'm just trying to get the name of that NPO, but I'm sure that the program manager will know which one it is because there was only one uh, uh, that didn't extend the, the, the contract, was cancelled, I think. Um, what happened to those individuals that was at that particular NPO? It was only the one, so I'm sure the program manager will know the name. Uh, oh, yeah, it is, it is ACVV Colors Dog. Close, sorry, they closed the organization in September 2019. They were funded. So what happened to the clients that was at that NPO and are we monitoring their, their well-being? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Mr. McKenzie. Um, Member Van Fogel, and is there anybody else that would like a question in this round? I don't see any hands. So after Member Van Fogel, we'll hand over to the department to respond. Thank you. Chair, Chair, mine is on page 33, uh, the last paragraph, uh, second last sentence. Um, the targeted feeding program. Um, Chair, what I want to know is what is the number of CNDs uh, that we have in the province and what does the decentralization mean? 
or are we likely to increase the number? Uh, and then on the on my last question, on page 59, uh, the employment and vacancies. Um, what I want to know also there is why are the social workers employed on contract basis? Um, and what are the details and duration of the contracts? And what is the update on the contracts? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to the department to respond. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, <clears throat> on the um, first question by Honorable Member Baku Baku Foss, um, what programs does social development have to address food insecurity? Uh, and are we partnering with agriculture on community gardens uh, and so forth? Um, the department is um, uh, leading the uh, um, well-being and dignity uh, work group together with um, the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sport and Agriculture, which has a specific uh, focus on food security. Um, so yes, we are definitely partnering with agriculture as well as um, the other departments in the province, particularly the Department of Health, in terms of helping us to monitor malnutrition cases and wasting so that we can target food uh, interventions in the areas where we're picking up the, the worst cases of uh, malnutrition, uh, which is usually through the clinics of the Department of Health and the offices of the Department of Health. Um, and also um, the, uh, the uh, Department of Education uh, is a big role player in terms of providing uh, school feeding and, um, and uh, support to learners. Uh, so, uh, yes, we, we are part of the, the, the larger um, collective that's working together. And of course, uh, part of the um, wellness and dignity work stream is also a, a large uh, NGO reference group that um, is uh, partnering with uh, the province, uh, which represents about 250 um, NGOs in the province uh, that uh, calls themselves the Food Forum. And um, we work with them as well. The and uh, the layman trustee is like yourself. You are not lawyers, you are not legal practitioners, you are Dr. McDonald, are you still there? Chairperson, something strange has just happened. Does someone need to be muted or are we yes. in a different room? Thank you. Someone, there was a cross line there. Um, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. I don't know which meeting that was. It sounded like a courtroom of some kind. <laughs> thanks. Uh, uh, thanks. HOD, could you speak up just a little louder, please? I'd, uh, I'd, it would make it easier for all of us. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, Chairperson, I will ask Mr. Airwood just to speak to some of the specific contributions that social development makes uh, to the provincial um, food security uh, initiative. Uh, thank you, HOD. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, in addition to what the HOD uh, indicated, it's important to mention that although we've got community nutrition and development centers, which are 92 in the province that we're supporting, that provide the food to people that need and are vulnerable, in our program, particularly early childhood development program, the ECD, we also provide the food to, 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 to the children that are in attendance. 40% of the spending per child that goes to food. In our child and youth care centers, uh, we, we, we are also providing food uh, there uh, through an outsourced uh, uh, service provider that actually caters in, in, in that type of, uh, of a situation. Also in our home-based child and youth care centers, there's an element of food provision. Everybody that is there is fed on a daily basis, three meals at least. In our old age homes, we're also providing food. But in addition to that, we are partnering with a number of NGOs in the humanitarian relief space uh, that we have assisted, uh, that we have provided them with, uh, with funding to procure um, food parcels. Also, we have also increased the, 
the, our, our provision of, 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 of food through the, the, an organization called Food Forward. That is an organization that uh, collects the food is in partnership with uh, Pick and Pay and other retail groups. It collects the food from these outlets and distributes them to NGOs that distribute them to community-based kitchens. So we have provided funding to that NGOs to sustain what, what they are doing. We are also providing support to community-based kitchens so that they can sustain the, 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 their feeding. These are the kitchens that have also partnered and supported the government through the provision of food in local areas so that people who are food insecure will at least be guaranteed one meal a day. So those are the interventions that we've got that are fully funded uh, by the department to reduce the food insecurity in, in, in the province. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Ewu. Um, I will also ask uh, Mr. Ewu to speak to the question about um, what programs are, uh, are being implemented to assist um, with needs, uh, youth uh, not in employment, education or training, um, and so what we do in the youth uh, development space. Uh, Mr. Ewu, um, can you uh, assist with that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. To you, Chair, once again. Uh, in the youth development space, we find the uh, non governmental organizations uh, that provide skills, mainly soft skills, to a number of young people who are not in education, employment, or in training. Uh, those organizations continue us right through the, the, the air in all the six districts, uh, the regions of. Um, social development, they actually provide developmental programs to, 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 to the young people that they are targeting. In addition to that, we've got the youth cafe intervention. We've got the currently 12 youth cafes were 13 uh, during the year under review, where young people are actually provided with a comfortable spaces uh, where they get uh, together, interact, uh, share ideas, share their challenges and so on and generate solutions among themselves and they are taught through the, the, the digital uh, digital interventions using the social media using the, the computers that we've got in all these youth cafes uh, they participate in the in the job readiness program some go and visit the youth cafes to be assisted and guided on how to structure their cvs so that they are more attractive uh, att so that they are more attractive for new jobs, the opportunities that might arise in, in, in the spaces. So that is by and large what we are doing in the youth development space. There are some of our uh, youth cafes that are also providing hard skills like plumbing, uh, welding. Uh, those youth cafes are partnering with the, the fitters uh, that, that give them a better funding so that they can actually come up and present those hard hard skill courses, which are relatively expensive for us to, 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 to actually provide those skills within the funding that we, we are providing as the Department of Social Development. So through the partnership with the FITAS, so those youth cafes like Isozo and Ifreikwant, it's got the hard skill programs, it's got the hard skills that they are, that they are providing to, 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 to the young people. And at the end of the program, young people are certificated at level one, two, three of the relevant intervention, be it plumbing and so on. So those are some of the programs that we are supporting and we are funding uh, in the province. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Hewu. Um, the, the next question from Honorable Member Baku Baku Foss are related to learner retention. Uh, and uh, the question was, what is the reason for the high dropouts uh, for children under 16? Um, and what, sorry, I'm getting some, uh, some cross uh, noise again. I'm not sure um, someone needs to be muted probably. It seems okay now. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, so the question was, what is the reason for the high dropouts and uh, what measures are taken to reduce this? 
And I think the, the, the primary role player in terms of addressing absenteeism and dropouts is the Department of Education. Um, but as I'd mentioned earlier, the um, Department of Social Development also uh, plays a role in terms of intervening where children uh, are identified to be at risk, either due to their family circumstances or due to their own um, behavioral challenges that need to be uh, addressed. Um, there are also numbers of children who leave school to go to um, other uh, education or other um, opportunities for development. So um, the, the, there's, there are various other um, uh, reasons why children drop out of school, um, but the, the full analysis would need to be requested from the education department since they, um, they are the custodians of that information and uh, we can't speak on their behalf in that respect. Um, in terms of the question about how many children uh, of these children land up in our child and youth care centres, um, it is estimated uh, that we have approximately 50% of the boys uh, and 20% of the girls entering the Department of Social Development secure care centres um, are, are um, school dropouts. So it is a large proportion of the children that come into our secure care environment that um, have dropped out of schools. Um, the, uh, we have engaged education department and, and as mentioned, we're, we're trying to create an institutional uh, mechanism to uh, improve the support and the coordination to the schools by the education department. Um, it should also be mentioned that some of the municipalities also have truancy initiatives that they have brought in place uh, to also support the education department. And then of course there is also the school safety work that's underway uh, to try and address some of the underlying causes of children dropping out uh, of school. Um, in many instances, the, the dropouts are um, also related to transport and accessibility and those kind of issues. So uh, learner transport is also an area um, that uh, the education department deals with. Um, in terms of uh, the question from uh, member Baka Baka Foss about uh, the uh, the upgrading of the shelters from National Public Works, uh, as well as the plan to build more shelters in GBV hotspots. Um, I did mention earlier we, we have received the um, custodianship of those uh, those six properties from the National Department of Public Works, and um, that uh, those shelters are uh, being prepared for occupancy. There are some issues with the readiness of those buildings for occupancy, someone will need some adjustments to be made and repairs to be done before they are ready to be occupied. Um, but we expect we'll be able to begin operating early in the new year. In terms of um, new shelters in GBV hotspots, um, as Mr. Garber had mentioned earlier on, uh, there are shelters that service those areas. Um, so uh, the, 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 those shelters are supporting uh, victims of GBV from, from those areas, even if they're not necessarily situated directly in the areas. Um, but uh, the, the, the department is prioritizing um, areas where we found that there's a need for those shelters, uh, where there's not enough um, spaces and shelters. Um, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Garber just to indicate um, which areas are priority areas at the moment for new shelter capacity. Um, Mr. Garber, are you there? Um, actually, were you looking yeah, for the yeah, capacity? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there. Okay. Yeah, the hey, question was... Yes, thank you, Mr. Garber. These the areas that, that uh, now for, 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 the, for, for, the, for the new... for the new shelters, right? They are in the Eden Carroll. Uh, uh, in the West Coast uh, and Lensburg and Hesekwa municipalities in the Eden Car, right? Uh, they are the ones that are coming from 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 the public works, right? Uh, uh, it's in Lensburg. It's in the West Coast. Uh, is the Aurora, these are all rural areas. And uh, what we are doing currently, 
this such as we, we are hesitant to say, in a sense, uh, well, I want to call it the poison chalice, in the sense that uh, we, need, we need to spend a lot to bring them to operational level, to operate a status. In terms of uh, ensuring that, uh, for example, they get municipal zoning certificates, we are in the process of fixing that before they can actually operate. Then in terms of seed funding as, as a department, we are ensuring that they are compliant in terms of OH, occupation health safety. And uh, we are also uh, getting the relevant staff and also mentors to come on board. But as FOT pointed out, we are already operationalizing them in a sense in terms of the funding, making funding available so that uh, at least early by mid, I mean early next year in January, they will start admitting people right up to, 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 to March. <clears throat> then these other areas, as we have indicated, that uh, these hotspots that have been declared, your deft, your, your, your youngers, they are already in the catchment areas of existing sites. Ten shelters are already in these areas. They are operating as we speak. And uh, the additional bed space that were created uh, during COVID, that is with five shelters, they are all in the metropolitan areas. So they are additional to, to, the, to the bed spaces we already have. So we, we, meaning that uh, we have got 15 operating shelters already in the metro because those additional files that were created, bed and space, they were not withdrawn, right? We are continue funding them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ewell. So, so uh, Mr. Garber, sorry, so basically what Mr. Garber is, is, is saying is that the, the shelters are actually serving the hotspots. Uh, we do have shelter spaces serving the hotspots already. But I see Mr. Jordan's hand as well. Thank you, HUD. I just want to confirm also with the new shelters. We're looking at about plus minus eight people per shelter in a cycle of 12 weeks. So we're talking about 50 people going through a process of every quarter, which will bring us up to an additional 200 bed spaces added to our already existing 20 shelters that we fund. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mr. Jordan. Um, so the, 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 the further question um, from member Dr. Bakos um, relates to the number of substance abuse treatment and rehabilitation initiatives supported by the Department of Social Development and whether we have any plans to increase that. Um, I will ask uh, Ms. Huerson, uh, to and, and Mr. Garber to, to respond to that. Thank you. Um, in terms of government centers, we have um, two for adults and three for children, or in, in any case, in all our child and youth centers, there's substance treatment programs, um, but there's three earmarked specifically for substance treatment. And then in terms of the NPOC of um, substance treatment centers, Mr. Garber, can you maybe come in there, please? Diesel, you might also come in, please. Uh, we have got six inpatient uh, centers that are supported by DSD, right? We, 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 we find them. And uh, to, to increase uh, uh, our presence, uh, that is in the air under review, uh, we, we, we empowered three unregistered centers through training to be in a position to register, and they are currently now registered. So this is how we are we are rolling out the, the, the increase, because we have the responsibility to register both, to, to look after registered and unregistered centers. So we prepare the unregistered one in order to be in a position to register. So in the year under review, we have trained and registered three shelters. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Garber. Um, then the, the following question uh, from Honorable Member McKenzie uh, regarding NPOs uh, not complying. Uh, the question was what, what sort of non-compliance? Well, I think um, there's various types of um, corrective plans and, and non-compliance that needs to be addressed. The first is potentially the, the administrative aspect uh, where NGOs don't have sufficient governance capacity to deal with funds allocated to them by DSP. Um, the second issue would be around norms and standards or legislative requirements that are specific to the relevant legislation um, that prevails in the area of service delivery they are engaged in. So uh, if an organization, for example, is rendering child protection services and we find that they are not uh, adhering to the norms and standards and legislated requirements of the Children's Act, uh, then, then we would also need to intervene on that level. So it is both uh, administrative and also service delivery standards where there may be a need for intervention um, and support. Um, but I will ask um, uh, uh, Ms. Debbie van Stade, um, or Debbie Dreyer rather, to, to speak to um, what they are doing with the Institutional Capacity Building Unit and what support they render um, over and above the support that's provided to NGOs by the actual program officers. Uh, Ms. Dreyer? Thank you, HOD. Uh, honorable members, the Institutional Capacity Building Unit in the department has got two uh, uh, services that they render. One is the MPO Help Desk, where members of the public can, enter, can come see uh, registration uh, support, new registration, re-registration, update of registration, registration compliance. We do this in the help desk face-to-face. Uh, -face. We also do it online, um, also over emails, um, WhatsApp, that's the one. The second uh, service that we render is we mentor 12 MPOs per year. These MPOs are sent via our various programs to the institutional capacity building unit. We have our internal team and these uh, 12 MPOs uh, we, we do five mentoring sessions with them, intense mentoring sessions with the board of management of a period of 12 months. We also expose them to a range of training. The mentoring would be on governance issues, financial management, project management, HR matters, taxation, compliance with the different regulations of the MPO Act, the trust, uh, um, the not-for-profit not companies act, or companies act, so a range of organizational and compliance issues that relates to how our organization functions. Um, we can only manage 12 MPOs per year as we have a very small team. So the programs identify the most at risk or the most needy and we work with them over a period of 12 months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dre. I think we should also emphasize that the um, Institutional Capacity Building Unit does intensive um, work with NGOs um, with a limited number, but there is also a lot of support rendered to NGOs by our regional offices and local offices in terms of helping them to get registered, um, helping them to uh, ensure that they are compliant with various um, legislation. And then there is also um, the program offices, whether it's the Older Persons Program or the um, uh, Children's uh, Child Protection Program, that also provide support to the NGOs that they fund uh, to help them become uh, compliant if they are not meeting norms and standards or basic governance issues. But if they have serious and extensive governance issues, then it's handed over to the institutional capacity building team. Uh, and then also the um, many of the programs also assist NGOs with the registration requirements for their particular area of service delivery, whether it's ECD registration uh, registration of old age homes, registrations of, of drug treatment centers or designation of child protection organizations. Um, so, so there's various arms of the department that provide support to the NGOs. Um, in terms of Honorable McKenzie's question about the vetting of, um, of uh, say temporary safety and foster parents, um, there's various reasons that um, parents would not uh, pass the um, requirements. Uh, I think the, the main reasons uh, tend to be that the home circumstances are not found to be suitable for children um, for whatever reasons. Uh, possibly uh, there's already a lot of um, uh, children in the family that the parents are caring for and, and it's not deemed to be likely that they can handle more uh, children that, uh, in addition to their own children. 
or alternatively that um, they, their homes are uh, in a very high risk area that may not be very safe as a, as a safe a temporary safety placement um, or the, the parents may have a criminal record um, that renders them unsuitable to work with children, although that is, tends to be a less of a reason. Uh, and then, of course, there is also administrative reasons, uh, for example, delays in um, the delivery of Form 30s uh, from the National Department of Social Development, which is clearance against the Child Protection Register. There's been a big backlog with that, um, which has delayed um, the approval of some uh, safety parents uh, because the Form 30s were not received, so the, the parents couldn't be cleared uh, to receive um, children from the courts uh, because they didn't have the necessary Form 30. Um, and uh, we are now in the process of trying to clear that backlog uh, with the National Department of Social Development. Uh, and uh, we are beginning to, um, to, to start to make uh, some inroads into that backlog, um, and which was particularly exacerbated as well by the, um, the COVID lockdown where the office closed nationally for a period of time, which led to a backlog, but also uh, there was a problem even before the, the lockdown, unfortunately. Um, it, it seems there may be a lack of capacity in the national office uh, that processes those requests for letters um, certifying people's names and not on the child protection register as being unsuitable to work with children. Um, some, some magistrates' courts will um, accept um, the um, criminal clearance, police clearance certificates alongside evidence that a request for the Form 30 uh, letter has been submitted to National DSD, even in the absence of the letter being issued, but uh, many of the magistrates will not accept that and do want to see a Form 30 clearance uh, that shows the, the um, compliance uh, to the Children's Act requirements. Uh, in terms of the MPO, um, RCFF here, Kalitzdorf, um, the, the clients uh, in that instance were taken over by the um, the um, Eden Karoo region. Um, so the, um, the Department of Social Development arranged for a satellite office to be made available in Kalitzdorf um, so that um, some of the team uh, that works in Oturin could be deployed to assist in Kalitzdorf in the absence of RCFF here. So those clients, uh, there was not large numbers of clients, but the, the clients were taken over by the Department of Social Development's local office uh, and are being assisted by the department's own social workers now. Uh, the question from Honorable Member Vindvogel, uh, in terms of the targeted uh, feeding program, um, the decentralization referred to in there refers to a process that National Department of Social Development went through um, during the year under review. Um, where the um, department, uh, national department has been funding uh, CNDCs across the country and decided that they would like to hand all of that over to the provinces. So that was what the decentralization was. They, they basically transferred the funds uh, and the contracts that they'd had and all other information relating to the funded uh, um, community nutrition and development centers uh, over to the provinces with effect from 1 April of this financial year. And um, the, the province has received that money uh, via Treasury um, to take over the funding of those CNDC sites from the national departments. The national department is no longer directly funding those CNDCs. They, the provinces are now doing it, including in our province. Um, are we going to increase the number of, of sites? Yes, we are going to increase the number of um, uh, local community kitchens, not necessarily the CNDCs per se, but um, the community, uh, local community feeding schemes, we are going to greatly increase um, the number of sites that we are supporting um, from our current baseline. Uh, we have already increased significantly, but we will be increasing further. Uh, we've been given additional money uh, from the National um, uh, Department uh, for Food Relief, um, and so we'll be using that. Uh, but I will ask Mr. Hewu to briefly speak to um, the number of CNDCs we currently fund, as well as the number of targeted feeding sites we currently fund. Um, uh, just, um, I think he does have that information available, so I'll just ask him to provide that. Thank you, thank you, Jody. Through you, Honorable Chair. Uh, the decentralization process that the AJOD spoke about, Honorable Chair, uh, it involved 20 uh, CNTCs in the province. So we've combined those 
with the 72 CMD targeted feedings, which we, we had in the province. And now we have, so that we, 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 we use one standard, one formula for disbursement of fund. funds. We have now moved from targeted feeding to CMDCs so that we, we actually use the same standards of funding to ensure that there's the same menu and we standardize our service wherever we are. We are now speaking in terms of community nutrition and development centers, which are 92 in the province of the Western Cape, and they are scattered around all the six districts uh, and, 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 and the municipalities, the district municipalities. And I can confirm that as from the 1st of April, we were ready to, to fund these new CMDCs from the funds that the national transferred and they were just disturbed by COVID. But well, I think if I'm correct, we are one of the two provinces that are actually running with the CMDC. Other provinces are still trying to get their administration and their contracting in place. Thank you, HOD. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Um, and then uh, the uh, final question from Honorable Member Binfogel was, um, why are the social work graduates employed on contracts and what are the details and duration of those contracts? I'll ask uh, Ms. van Riemen to speak to that briefly. Thank you, HOD. These people that's been appointed on contract is our social work graduates who had a bursary and the Public Service Act and Regulations makes provision that they can come if you've got funding to allow them to work back their bursary obligations. Most of them had a bursary for four years, so they're working back their four-year bursary obligation. During the period under review, we had 96 of them um, in our services on contract. Um, and um, of the 96, um, already 38 of them um, were successful to get permanent post in our department. We continue to, with the earmark funding for the 37, um, that we continue to have them until we've got the funding available. And then from the COE, we've, we had the, 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 the other 63 um, in our services. Um, they assist largely with the capacity in terms of the shortage of social workers in our regions, also at head office. So they spread across the region, more or less 15 to 16 in each region um, to, to assist um, with the social worker functions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Van Riemen. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they are on contract because they have a four year um, bursary obligation to work back um, and they're appointed for that four year period. Um, but um, in terms of the Public Service Act, they, they can't be appointed permanently without a recruitment and selection process. So many of them do apply for um, permanent posts and are successful. But uh, in terms of the bursary agreement, they, they, they have to work back a four year contract period. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, um, again, for those comprehensive um, responses. Um, members, um, are there any other questions um, that you'd like to pose on this section that we're on at the moment, dealing with pages 32 to 100? I see Member Vintvoho. Any other members besides Member Vintvoho? Member Van Pocho, you may go ahead, and then followed by Member Baku Baku Force. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, Chairperson, uh, my question is on page 68, uh, strategy and objective indicators. Um, what I want to know from the HOD, what, what, what were or what are the reasons for missing the target? And how many elderly people die due to natural causes? whether in the re residential facilities. And then I want to also, Jay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. we can hear you. Okay. Okay, and then on page 69, the also um, performance indicators on staff program 2.2. Um, why is the department missing the target and why is it achieving less than the numbers uh, it achieved in previous years? And does this uh, underachievement um, signify a department that is not, of, is failing the elderly people? That's just my feeling. Then the last question, Chair, 
is uh, on um, page, uh, sorry, page yeah, 74. Uh, also, sub program 3.2 care and service to families must target. What are the reasons for missing target? And why is the blame placed on COVID 19, which only affected one month of the year under review? Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you very much, Member Bakabaku Fort. Member Baku Baku Force, are you there? Yes, sir, can you hear me? We can hear you now, you can go ahead. Sir, my question. It's on number 76. Member Baku Baku Force, you've just disappeared there for a minute. Can you move can closer? Can you hear to me the... now, sir? We can hear you, Mike. Can, can, can you repeat the question? My question is on page 76, sir. P76, it's sub program 3.3 child care and protection. Number of services we will be able to have in the rest of the year in the situation we are in. Member Baku Baku Force, you disappeared there again for a moment. We just heard the number of children reunified. Member Baku Baku Force, can you move closer to the mic? You've disappeared there again. Tim, let me repeat. Thank you. I was asking, what is the number of homeless children in the province and what are the reasons for not achieving all this sub program? such as compliance with municipal Yes, Member Philando. Chairperson, I'm not sure whether Thank it's only on my side, but I'm unable to hear uh, Member Baku Baku Force. I'm also having the same challenge. The sound keeps on dipping out. Member Baku Baku Force, are you able to move around just to get a better signal? Because we seem to be losing you all the time. Is it? Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member. Number seven, uh, page 79 is talking about the numbers of registered uh, patient care facilities, the challenges and experience yep. with the requirements for the registration, such as compliance with municipality bylaws, zoning and fire certificate. Did you hear that one? Uh, you did no, not hear me when I was asking this question. I was no. asking that what is the number of patient care facilities? that experience challenges with registra registration and what measures are put in place to assist them in this regard. And okay. in page 18... Before you um, continue, continue ma'am, can you go okay. back to the question on page 76? We didn't hear that one as well. The okay. number of... Let me go back. Okay. 
in number se page 76, I was talking about the STAP pro program that is uh, in 3.3, that is child care and protection. The department is saying the number of children reunified with their families or alternative care it was 14. And I was asking what is the number of homeless children in the province? I was also asking what are the reasons for not achieving all these programs? That was um, number 76. And in number 80, I, uh, I want to ask regarding the number of children in residential care in, in funded NPO, CYCCs, in terms of the children is Act 19. The department is saying the performance de depending on the availability of bed spaces within appropriate gender and age categories. But my question is as follows, what are the reasons for achieving less than the number? Sorry, Cheng, about that. My question is that what are the reasons for achieving less than the numbers that was achieved last year? And that this means there are bad shortages in our CYCCs. I would love to know that. And the last question is that uh, is in page 85 um, on the sub program 4.2 crime prevention and support. No, uh, let let me skip that one. I'm going to 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 page 87, the sub program 4.4 substance abuse prevention and rehabilitating. The number of services using users accessing substance abuse services. And I want to ask, how does the referral process work? Why is it only 10,000 users accessing the services when we know there are thousands of others out there in need of the services? Is there a possibility of increasing funding so that more drug users can access the service and what is the number of rehabilitation centers that we have in the province? And the last question Chen, is in 88. I want to know, uh, uh, the slide is in the sub -pro program 4.4, substance abuse prevention and rehabilitation. Um, I would like to ask um, Shepherd how does the referral process work? Why is it no? Why is it only ten thousand using accessing service when we know there are thousand? No, I I, ju I just asked this one. I just asked this one. Let me ask number eight eight and pause. The sub program four point four substance abuse prevention and rehabilitation. So, Richard, for repeating, you know these technologies and uh, yeah. Well, uh, I want to know, Chairperson, why is the number of services users who receive assistance less than number assisted in previously, in previous year? Thank you, Chair. That was my last question. Thank you very much, uh, Member Baku Baku Force. Uh, 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 yes, Member Baku Baku Force. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, my last question is page 98 in the violence against women. That is my last, last question. Okay. Uh, the department is saying 15,961 15, million was earmarked in the 2019-2020 financial year for the expansion of the VEP to prevent violence against women and children. I would like to know what are the plans to increase the funding for GBV programs in the in the province. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, members. Um, um, with that, um, if I could perhaps just ask um, the HVD and the Minister, um, I, I note that there was an overachievement in the number of 
uh, victims of crime and violence accessing psychosocial support. And I just wanted to get an understanding of what the impact um, of that um, overachievement would have been on the capacity of the department, noting that um, the department doesn't um, always have the, the staff available, and also how does the department measure the impact of psychosocial support, particularly for, for victims of domestic violence. Um, and then um, also the same with the, um, under subprogram 3.5 on the child and youth care centers, there was an um, overachievement there in terms of um, the number of children in um, CYCCs. Has that also caused capacity challenges, especially because the department has now insourced all of the POSASA facilities as well? And how, what impact has that had, had on, on the staff um, and the, the functioning of those facilities? And then on the support provided to NPOs, the um, capacity building support to the NPOs, uh, are you able to give us an indication of the type of training or capacitation assistance that was most frequently requested or provided by the department? And then maybe also give us reasons to why it's that specific um, service. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to uh, the HOD and the minister and their, their teams. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Chairperson. Um, I will respond to the questions in the order that they were uh, put. Uh, the first question related to um, the reason for missing targets on the older persons and also how many older persons died in the facilities um, and also why is DST uh, um, have lower numbers for some of the targets than previous years. Um, I'll ask Mr. Denzel Cowley to speak to that. Um, in terms of residential facilities where we underachieved um, by 181 on a target of 9,000, approximately 2% of older people in frontline facilities dies of natural causes, so they do have quite an impact on reaching the target. Um, secondly, it takes a bit of time to fill up a space, so once someone uh, is deceased, they leave the room open for a month um, in terms of cleaning it, but also to approach other people on the waiting list to come in. So it often takes a month to two months before that space is filled again, um, and that also reflects in terms of the, the targets. We're also sitting with a situation that in some of our old age homes, due to the lack of facilities for persons with disability, um, there are people under the age of 60 with disability also in some of these residential facilities. Um, in terms of our targets for the um, community-based services, um, this is usually affected by seasonal influences, so in winter, older people um, tend to attend less activities that's presented, um, and school holidays also has an influence when our grannies usually look after the school children or their grandchildren during school holidays. But we also need to take in consideration that um, service centers closed down prior to the level five lockdown, three weeks prior to that, um, it was recommended that they close their services and this had an impact on numbers. Um, in terms of independent and assisted living, um, the underperformance there is also due to people under the age of 60 that cannot be counted um, in these residential facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cowley. Um, the, um, the next question um, from uh, Honourable Member Buchel, um relates to the um, care to families and why targets were missed. Um, I think the, the, the uh, different uh, regions of the department, as well as the NGOs that we fund to do these programs, um, they do sessions with the families, so they, they, have, um, they do group sessions um, so there were sessions also planned for um, the uh, March month of the uh, year under review um, that had to be cancelled due to the um, arrival of COVID in that month, uh, which would then have impacted the, um, the outcomes, uh, which is the reason uh, for that. So those, those um, sessions 
are can uh, can have uh, fairly large numbers of people in each engagement, up to 10, 10 to 15 parents in one uh, session at times. And uh, if you add that up across all the regions and the NGOs, then uh, you would see um, that actually the last month's uh, impact of COVID did actually have a, 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 a did affect the numbers. Um, the question from uh, Honourable Member Baku Baku Foss uh, regarding uh, child protection and what is the number of homeless children in the province? I think the first issue, the uh, homeless children, there are, there are very few homeless children in the province. There's no exact figure, um, but um, those those numbers will be very few. I think the, we, we do, the department does work with street children and the vast majority of the street children, uh, in fact, I'd say probably 99% of them uh, or um, do actually have a home, um, but they they are on the streets um, either because their own parents are sending them uh, to go and um, f uh, try and get money, uh, or because their home situation is um, a, a, a volatile and they are uh, they go and rather stay on the streets to avoid um, a toxic environment in in the home, uh, in which case they are then brought in and um, placed in. Uh, into another um, a safe placement by the Department of Social Development social workers through the Children's Court. Um, and uh, but, but as I say, the majority are, um, are on the street uh, who do have homes, so they, they're not homeless children as such. Um, but the challenge of street children is a serious one because um, the children on the streets um, are exposed to a lot of um, uh, risks, including sexual predators, uh, drug dealing uh, and and uh, substance abuse themselves, as well as uh, exposure to to um, traffic uh, risk and and criminal elements. So so it, it is a it is a serious yeah. issue. Um, I think the 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 the, the question about um, reunification and not achieving targets, uh, reunification of children with families is always a challenging issue. Um, often the children have been removed from a family for a good reason, um, usually because the family's environment is um, is uh, challenging and, and there is potentially domestic violence or child abuse uh, and neglect. So, so it is quite a long process uh, to work on reunifying children with their family and the department uh, always endeavours to do this where, where it is deemed to be possible but uh, it's not always successful. It really depends on the family involved and whether the program, whether they respond well to the programs um, that are implemented. Uh, so reunification is a very unpredictable process um, and very difficult to, to be sure whether you're going to meet a target or not on that. Uh, in terms of um, the uh, question regarding uh, registered partial care facilities, I'll ask uh, Ms. Lufa Hamdalay to, to give a, a brief response uh, on the question of the number of partial care facilities facing challenges with registration and what the department is putting in place to assist them. Uh, Ms. Hamdalay. Thanks very much, APD, and thanks very much, Honorable Bakabukhus, for the question. Um, the answer to the number of facilities struggling to meet the registration requirements. Um, for this particular year, I would say that it would be, um, according to this, would be about one and two of the facilities that was, was, was um, Planning to become re-registered. Re um, the certificate for registration, for full registration, is five years, and for conditional registration, is about two years. So the um, it's quite a fast and furious process where we constantly have to relook at the registration requirements, and the registration requirements are quite onerous in terms of meeting the compliance with the municipal bylaws and the zoning and fire clearances, <coughs> and we have. And also, there are about 2,300 unregistered facilities that are also starting to become registered for the very same reason. What we've put in place is the Minister has uh, provided us with um, the opportunity to conditionally register facilities without building plans and without zoning certificates. But we make sure that the children, um, that we have fire clearance certificates and also the health and safety clearance certificates. In addition, we've also started to the process of drafting provincial guidelines for registration of partial care facilities in the province um, with local government. And this document is being consulted 
within the local government space at the moment. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a bit of cough. Um, we also are going to be implementing a Rangasali campaign. We um, within the new year, and we've all been orientated on this, where we can register facilities um, <coughs> on three levels: bronze, silver, and gold. Um, and that will also allow people, allow facilities, um, opportunity to enter into the um, registration, to be able to obtain a registration status while they um, obtain the necessary municipal clearances to become fully registered. I think that's in a nutshell um, answering the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ms. Amdele. I think also the uh, the legislation, particularly the regulations for, re for, for registration purposes are also very onerous, as you've mentioned, and um, we have asked the National Department of Social Development to uh, look at um, reviewing the registration requirements because we feel that they are unrealistic and they also discriminate against ECDs that are in informal areas because they require certain things that are only in place in formal areas, uh, which it becomes a, a fundamental barrier to um, ECDs operating in informal areas. So requirements such as building plans um, are not realistic to be uh, for, for um, uh, ECDs operating in informal areas, though there's uh, very seldom um, building plans available. Uh, the same applies to zoning and, and so forth, where, they, where there's no zoning scheme in place, it becomes an impediment. So. Uh, the National DSD has indicated they are open to considering that and that they are going to look at it and try and make it slightly easier um, for NGOs to register. But of course now with the ECD function moving over to the Education Department, it will fall to the uh, National Minister of Education to amend those regulations should, um, should that go forward. Um, and then um, uh, uh, in terms of um, Honourable Member Bakubaku Foss's question, about um, the um, uh, the uh, underachieving uh, on on page 80 relating to child and youth care centres, I'll ask uh, Ms. Uh, Leona Horsen to uh, respond to that. Thank you. Thank you, HD. Um, in terms of uh, the question uh, related 3.5.1.1, um, I will. I have to be honest that we are stretched for bed spaces and available bed spaces at any given point in time. Um, due to the increased need of children um, in care, we are hesitant to increase that number because we believe that children in that level of care should be mostly accommodated within the foster care system. And we constantly try to enhance in, um, access to the foster care system rather than in institutional care. In terms of the specific reasons for this underperformance is that most of our child and youth care centres, which I refer now to um, is the old children's homes, follow a cottage model where, for instance, uh, eight, ten boys are sleeping and then a vacancy occurs there. But our request um, may be for a girl or a toddler or an older, older boy who falls out of that age group. And that... Um, differs throughout the year, and therefore um, there might be bed space available, but they do not fit the available bed spaces that are available. How do we how we, do we address it? We evaluate on an annual basis when we um, re-look our funding, um, what was the most pressing need of the past year, and how can we move around our funding and the available bed spaces so that we can accommodate the specific um, needs that arose the previous year that couldn't be accommodated. There is some other questions, but it's later on, actually. Thank you, Ms. Horsen. Um, the, the next question um, from uh, Honourable Member Baku Baku Foss related to um, the referral process for substance abuse treatment. Um, the uh, the referral process involves first an assessment by a social worker to determine uh, whether a person um, that is um, uh, that's approaching the department 
or that has been referred to the department uh, uh, to see what uh, what their situation is and what would be the appropriate intervention. Not everybody would need to go for a rehabilitation program. Some some clients can be assisted through uh, early intervention process um, with um, with limited counselling sessions and um, and uh, engagement with a social worker or um, a related professional. So. Uh, it's not everyone that goes into formal um, a drug rehabilitation process. Um, the referral process would also involve determining whether an outpatient or a residential program would be more suitable. Uh, some some uh, um, uh, persons would benefit from a um, community-based treatment or outpatient uh, treatment uh, process where they, they attend on a um, a, a non-residential basis, a, a, a counselling and treatment program and a support group uh, and so forth. Uh, and others would be uh, particularly uh, clients who are in a very serious state um, would be better suited to go to a residential treatment program where they stay um, for an extended period of time. Uh, the, the referral process can either be um, voluntary or involuntary. Uh, so some clients will be willing to go and they will uh, therefore get a referral from the social worker and be admitted. Uh, but there are also some clients who are ordered by the court uh, to, to be admitted to drug treatment programs and those clients uh, are involuntarily admitted. Um, those, the, the, this very, we don't have very high numbers of those clients, but uh, we do get them. Um, and uh, then there will be a lot of um, uh, clients who also um, would be um, uh, would be suitable for uh, uh, alternative interventions, but I think the the issue that the honourable members are raising is that there's only around ten thousand service users accessing services when there is an, uh, appears to be a greater need than that. I think the the first issue is that um, not everyone who who has a substance abuse problem is going to be willing uh, to come forward and get treatment. And also, um, the court process, uh, courts will, will the court process needs to be initiated by um, somebody. So, if someone is not willing to come forward and they not the department's not aware of them needing assistance, um, then then the, the, it will be down to a family member or uh, someone else uh, who has some relation with that person to initiate the court process to have them admitted. Uh, not everyone's willing to go through that. Um, so. Uh, there are a lot of service users or, or potential service users who don't access services um, due to not wanting to access services. Um, but I think that, you know, as a, as a department, um, we have upscaled um, funding enormously um, for drug treatment over the last 10 years. Uh, and we are now at the point where um, we, we, we are now getting our budgets cut so um, at best we'll be able to sustain levels. Uh, I think this applies to all the other areas. I mean, we we also in the same boat when it comes to um, the uh, spaces in child and youth care centres, in old age homes, uh, disabled homes, all all of our services. Uh, we would want to be able to expand, but we can't because our budgets have now been uh, capped, and um, we we are just at this moment doing our best just to sustain what we currently have. Um, uh, so expansion would only really be possible um, uh, after about two to three years when we get past the worst of the um, uh, recession's effects on our budgets across the country. And I, I think we're all in this boat, uh, all departments are in the same boat in this respect. Um, the, in terms of the total number of uh, rehabilitation centres in, in, uh, in the province, um, we have uh, we currently have six inpatient programs, 30 community-based sites, uh, and six NPOs are funded to do early intervention uh, in tw in 29 schools. Uh, so we do have school-based uh, programs running as well. Um, and of the programs uh, that we have, uh, five are um, uh, have of our own government centres uh, also providing uh, treatment services. Two of those are for adults. Uh, that's Kensington and Denova, and then uh, three are providing treatment services for youth um, in our child and youth care centres. Uh, so, uh, so we have uh, quite a massive spread. Uh, if you compare what we have in this province to other provinces, it's uh, we we are 
uh, much we have a much much bigger footprint than than any other province uh, as uh, relative to our population uh, when it comes to substance abuse treatment programs. Um, the the numbers um, uh, why the numbers were slightly reduced from the previous year. I think the uh, the first issue is that um, in the previous year uh, there were um, slightly higher targets, but we were finding there was a lot of people. Uh, who are not making uh, making it through um, the particularly non-residential programs um, due to uh, transport challenges, particularly are a major problem uh, for non-residential programs. Um, and so the retention rates um, resulted us in, in us having a slightly lower than expected outcomes. So we did reduce the targets because we, we knew uh, that we were not going to be able to reach um, what we'd hoped. Uh, due to the fact that retention rates were not always reliable. Uh, obviously, at the end of the year as well, rehabs um, had some difficulties with COVID, but that wasn't a significant factor in the, in the numbers. I think the main issue has been the dropouts from the programs, uh, particularly the non-residential. The residential programs have a slightly better retention rate than the non-residential programs. Um, we have done an evaluation this year as well of these issues uh, to look at how we can uh, address them as best, we, as best possible. Um, but uh, I think that's the, those are the main issues. I don't know whether uh, Denzel Kali would like to add to that, given that um, he was managing for the year under review. No, actually, I'm not coming. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kali. Um, then, in terms of uh, the Member Baku Baku Foss's question relating to um, GBV and the 15 million earmarked for the expansion of victim empowerment programs, um, we are uh, we, so we, we have received those additional amounts, uh, but plans to increase funding for GBV programs next year at this point, um, the, the, there's not going to be much scope to increase significantly, although we have put additional allocations into G in, uh, to some degree into GVV programs this year already, which will be carried through into next year. So that earmarked allocation additional amount will continue. Um, and also we have shifted some additional funds to cover the uh, six new sites that we're going to take over from National Transport and Public Works. Uh, and there are also um, some other areas where we're going to expand um, bed spaces as well. But uh, as with substance abuse and all the other programs, uh, we have very limited scope uh, in the next two years to do it, but after that, again, we should be able to be, uh, continue to expand uh, once we are able to get more funding um, from the provincial treasury. Um, in terms of uh, Honourable Member Bosman's question around overachievement on the psychosocial support services and the impact on the department in terms of increased demand, uh, yes, the, that, that does put additional pressure on the department. Um, it, it, does also depend as well on uh, what is happening with other service areas um, and whether the um, numbers are decreasing in some of those other areas. But generally speaking, we have faced an across the board increase in demand. So yes, there is more pressure on the social workers. As um, we uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we were able to get uh, the, the nearly 100 additional social work graduates to help relieve some of this pressure. Uh, and also, um, we in some instances have also um, be able to get the uh, funded NGOs to assist in um, taking up uh, some of this workload as well, um, and, uh, which, uh, and which they've done so very effectively. Uh, so between the NGOs that we fund and um, the additional personnel we brought in, uh, we, uh, we are uh, able to try and carry that, but the, the, there is a concern about the ever-growing caseloads on the social workers. And as I mentioned before, I think one of the major benefits of the amendments to the Children's Act that are coming um, will be to at least take some pressure off uh, the administrative work that they're doing with the courts um, so that um, family-based uh, foster placements uh, don't need to come through our systems in the same way anymore, which will certainly assist and then free them up to then focus on uh, some of the other areas where they are facing additional pressure. Um, in terms of the overachievement uh, in, uh, in children in child and youth care centres, I'll ask Ms. Khorsen, uh to speak uh, specifically to the uh, over um, the, the pressure. But I, I also forgot to respond to the question about how do we measure impact of the psychosocial support services. I think um, the, the, the impact is measured in the process that's undertaken by 
the uh, social service professional. Um, they keep a case file on each of their clients and they monitor the progress. And if the client's situation uh, is deteriorating and they aren't able to assist at their level, then they would refer a client to a more intensive intervention, um, whether it's with uh, one of our specialized support NGOs or whether it is with um, a Department of Health facility for um, psychiatric support if required. Um, but uh, again, it is a, it's a qualitative, uh, not a quantitative measure. Um, but I think that um, it's it's part of the the monitoring of um, the social work uh, process that's undertaken by the uh, or within the social work supervision framework uh, to check on the quality of casework that's being done by the social workers by their supervisors. So there's an assurance system built in there that looks at um, looks at uh, how uh, the clients are doing and making sure that they are receiving the necessary support. But in terms of measuring impact uh, quantitatively, that is very difficult. Again, that requires longitudinal studies to look at how the people have responded over time and how uh, it's improved their resilience uh, and, uh, and uh, whether they've been able to recover, for example, from post-traumatic stress disorder and, and other um, associated harms. So it's again, it's a longitudinal uh, assessment that's required to measure those kind of impacts. Um, child and youth care centres, I'll ask uh, Ms. Corson to speak to that question. Thank you. Yes, thank you, actually. Um, in terms of the, the initial question on Busasa, Busasa's numbers were already factored into this totals because we always counted them as part of our service delivery. Um, so in terms of services to children, it did not impact on the total. Um, it did, however, in increase our staff um, establishments, which, of course, uh, plus, uh, put additional pressures, um, everything to do with, with staff management. In terms of, of this increased number, this total must be looked together with the um, awaiting trial numbers in terms of page 85, where there was a reduction. Now, we would um, want to see a, a more increase in numbers in 3.5.1.2 because we still view this as a gateway or gatekeeper um, placement um, for a child before he enters the, the criminal justice um, type of placements. So we have doubled our um, maror intake um, during the last year uh, under question so that we can effectively assess children before we decide on a placement. And then also all children that were applied for to move deeper into the system, say for instance, they were in a level two child and youth care center or in foster care, um, multi um, professional panels were held um, in order to, put, to first establish if there's a need for placement and uh, secondly, what will be the appropriate placement. Then um, the courts also saw the value because we are dependent or the courts decide to place a child. We are dependent on, um, uh, or we are the, driven by the court to place the children. Um, and they saw the value of, of using um, a child earlier, placing a child with behavior challenges earlier rather than wait for the child to offend. Um, and uh, what we also have done then is if we, we didn't build additional places for these children. If we under, saw a decrease, for instance, in a waiting trial, uh, and because we run multi-program centers, we could um, close a certain section for a waiting trial and increase bed space for children on in terms of the need for programs with behavioral challenges. Um, so yeah, I think that's the reason. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Horsen. Um And then uh, the the final question from uh, uh, member, Buck, uh, uh, sorry, member Bosman was around uh, the support for NPOs and the type of training most frequently requested. Um, and why is that? Uh, I'll ask Ms. Uh, Van Star, uh, sorry, Ms. Dreyer um, to speak to that question. Thank you. Thank you, HOD, uh, honorable members. The main request for training from NPOs comes on how to remain compliant with the MPO Act, how to fundraise in these difficult times, how to practice good financial management and oversight, and how to remain compliant with the tax regulations from SARS. These are the main issues that, that MPOs asked us to train on. 
uh, we, in terms of the compliance, it's not only the NPO Act, but it's also the trust and the not-for-profit companies and the Companies Act. And how, what is the relationship between these three? And how can uh, NPOs remain both compliant with the with the NPO Act as well as with the Trust Act, as well as with the Companies Act? Because some of them don't understand the difference between the three, and that they can be compliant with all three at the same time if they have the proper systems in place. Uh, one of the key pro, uh, uh, pro problems that NPOs are experiencing in these times is the fact of how do they actually raise funds? It is a difficult um, question. We do have training um, and other parties that do training on innovative fundraising strategies using social media, uh, using various local initiatives, how to approach companies, how to know what companies are supporting. It is a difficult issue at the time and we are offering a range of, of support, training support online and in person um, and referrals to other programs in terms of how to fundraise and how to raise money and how to manage good oversight on the money that is raised. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jaya. Um, that concludes our responses to this round of questions, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, um, members. I'm just being mindful of the time, so I'm now going to table the um, other parts of the report. Um, if members have any specific questions on Part C, they're welcome to ask uh, that, but just um, indicate the page number, but that is comprehensively covered in the uh, scoper section. Uh, I'm now going to ask you if you've got any questions on that, if you could please pose that. Um, also, if you could pose any questions that you have on Part D, which is now also being tabled, so that's pages 118 to 153. If I can get an indication from members of whether they've got any questions on those sections. None, Chairperson. Members Baku Baku Force, Bunfoho and Mackenzie, do you have any questions on Nothing my side, Chairperson, nothing. Part C or Part D? Nothing my side, thank you. Thank you. Member Vanfogel and Member Baku Baku Force? I don't see any hands from Member Vanfogel or Member Baku Baku Force. And I don't have any verbal indication as well. Um, I'm going to ask again for the last time if there's anybody from the public who would like to pose a question that is logged on. Okay. Um, Minister Fernandez and uh, Dr. McDonald, is there um, any closing remarks that you'd like to meet uh, to make? Thank, thank you, um, Honourable Chairperson and Honourable Members. Uh, from my side, I just want to express my thanks again at the manner in which this um, engagement was conducted, transparent yet robust. Um, I also want to thank you for your leadership um, throughout the year. This is, I think, the last official um, event that we have as a team DSD. So I'd like to say thank you to you and the members of the committee and wish you a blessed and festive, uh, safe festive season. And then last but not least, to say thank you to HOD McDonald and the entire team that have been on this platform today and those who are uh, in support for their unfailing commitment and dedication to Project DSD in the Western Cape. As I said, we are about two and a half thousand officials and we have a huge target market. We have, I think, just over six million individuals in this province. So we cannot do it without the support 
of active citizens, civil society, all stakeholders, and most importantly, the honorable members who work with us and who also hold us accountable in terms of the work that we are expected to do and the mandates that we need to deliver on. So on that note, Chairperson, I wish to say thank you for the engagement and a good day further to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McDonald. Is there any closing comments or remarks from your side? Um, thank you, Chair. Just to um, add my appreciation to the Chair and the Committee um, for um, the session and uh, working with the Department during the course of this year and to also uh, thank the Minister for her leadership and uh, support and uh, the, the entire um, management team present and of course uh, our staff uh, who are not present but uh, are uh, still as we speak working at the coalface uh, to support um, everyone uh, they need to support in the province. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, both uh, Minister Fernandez and Dr. McDonald, as well as to all the DSD um, staff members across the province who've had a very difficult and unusual year, and they've persevered. And I know that many of them will be busy as we um, close for the year. They don't always close, and they don't get to spend the time with their families that we, we all hope for. We're very grateful for your continuous engagement with this committee and also for the comprehensive responses that we also get. Um, colleagues from DSD, you are welcome to exit the meeting. <laughs> Members, I please ask that you stay behind so that we can uh, finalize our report and just complete some committee business. Thank you very much, colleagues from DSD. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Chair. Goodbye, Thank you, Chair everyone. Members. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Minister. Bye-bye, HOD. Bye-bye, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the festive. Members, um, I am now going to ask um, if you have any recommendations that you'd like us to include into the report, or are there any requests for further information that you would um, need. Yes, Member Baku Baku Force, you can go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Chair. I don't, uh, I, I just want to say, you know, uh, um, I feel like uh, if it was a fire and um, wood and um, the petrol, I would say it worked well. You know, uh, I don't have a, a, any question. I'm, uh, I'm satisfied the way the department uh, answered our questions. So I don't have a recommendation on the table. Only thing that I want to say, Chairperson, well done, you led us. Uh, thank you, Member. Uh, member Philander. Thank you, Chairperson. You just got your Christmas box from Member Baku Baku Force. <laughs> <laughs> Chairperson, uh, Minister Fernandez made mention um, of the MOUs um, that are in place with most municipalities in the Western Cape. Chairperson, is it possible for us um, to request that information for the period um, reported on in terms of our um, local drug action committees as well as um, the inclusion of GBV strategies, um, Chairperson, as well as the gender forums um, how they are functioning and which um, municipalities the MOUs are with, Chairperson. But can we also then um, request, Chair, in terms of, of um, reporting or accountability, which of those are active and how does the informa information filter back from the ground or from the municipalities back into the system of, of province place? 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Namonde, did you get all of that? Not everything, Chair. I remember, unfortunately, Member Flander was a little bit fast for me. Um, Member okay, Flander? I put it in writing, Chair, please, sir. Thank yes. you. That would, be, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Namonde, was there anything that you picked up um, that we should include? Um, I picked up two two resolutions from Member Paku Paku. I don't know whether she still wants the information. The committee requested the department to provide it with a copy of the department's child murder and the reduction plan, and the Western Cape and the copy of the Western Cape Government Prevention and Early Intervention Strategy for Children and Families in the province. So those were the two documents that I jotted down. Can um, can I ask that we get that? I mean, then we just maybe ask for an update in terms of the first resolution. We ask for an update on the child death review project, which we were presented with earlier this year um, or last year. I don't remember. Is that in order with you, Member Baku Baku Force? Yes, Chair. Perfect. Namonde, anything else that we, we still need to, to get to? No, Chair. We are done for the day. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I will drop the report, Chair. Then it will be adopted next year, sometime next year. I don't know exactly when. The date will be communicated in due course. Perfect. Um, I also just want to just um, remind members that in our engagement with the South African Social Security Agency, they promised to give us numbers of, of um, staff members at the different regional offices that we could use. So, Namonde, if we can just, um, I'm not sure if we've got it yet, but if we can just make sure that that gets distributed, especially as we go into the holidays, we're going to get inundated with calls from people with problems with SASA. Um, something that I noted yesterday when I was, uh, the day before yesterday, I was in Oatswaran and there was a massive queue and chaos at the post office. And luckily, Namonde, on her first day back at work, was able to get me some answers from SASA. And it turns out that two people were stabbed to death, actually, in that um, queue fighting over SRD grants because the systems that SASA and the post office has in place is, is wholly inadequate. So, um, Please, members, if, you, if there's anything urgent over the holidays, um, make sure that you use the minister's contact number as well as the officials in the department and anything that needs to be escalated to us, please do that as well. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful year, albeit half of it via the computer. And I look forward to seeing you all next year once we're all vaccinated. And I wish you well over the next um, few weeks as you hopefully take a very well-deserved break. The meeting is then adjourned, but I also want to say thank you to Namonde and to Ben, as well as to Clarence and the entire IT team for making sure that we can work safely from home. Bye, Danki, Mkosi Kakulu. Stay safe, all of you.